Well, let's find out why. Oh, I know why. <laughs> Nitro number 163, also November 2nd, although I didn't have the right date on here. here we go. So the show opens with a commercial for World War Three. Yeah, they say World War Three is coming, and then out comes a German. <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I hadn't yeah. thought of it. It was Norman Smiley versus Alex Wright. I thought it was a fun match. It was a fun match, but it was just a match. They had a match, and then a guy won. Alex Wright. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I endorsed this. That sounds awesome. Yeah, but no. if they're in a wrestling war, and they trot out Norman Smiley and Alex Well, Wright, I'm not going to say it's, it's the biggest a bad opener. I mean, you got three hours. you got to fill some time, but man. It's, it's not just the opener. It's the first, like, three or four matches on this show. Oh, we'll get into them. It just... Alex Wright. So Alex wins Norman the next Smiley. breaker. And this continues his mission to beat all the other European wrestlers in the roster. Then it occurred to me, the other company actually has a European title and isn't doing anything nearly this logical with it. Can you imagine WCW doing something illogical? It happened. <laughs> kind of. Disco Inferno versus Kaz Hayashi. Again. This was better than the opener. It was a fun yeah. match that meant nothing. Yeah. I'll agree with that. So Kaz got a near fall with a moonsault, and now comes Sonny Ono. So, Sonny's been a manager for however many years he's been around. Two or three years, it seems. He now declares himself the number one Japanese wrestler in the company, and also undefeated. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. Well, he's never lost. Well, he has never lost, but, I mean, Gene Okerlund's undefeated. He is. So, Kaz chased him around, and Disco caught him coming back in, and he piled over for the win. Ono says, Hayashi is a disgrace to his country. Yes. And he is number one and undefeated. All righty. Me and Gene brought Booker T out for a promo. He was all over the place early. Mm-hmm. First of all, he's been gone for a long time, and it took me like half the show to remember why he was gone. He says he needs a match with Bret Hart to prove himself. It's a great promo, by the way. He's got it great. Was? He's got great delivery. His emotion was great, and his his finish at the end was great. I had no idea he was talking about the first half of it. First, That's he's okay. talking about calling. Okay, <laughs> it's probably because you forgot everything that that had happened. Yeah, he says he needs a match with Bret Hart to prove himself. So I said, okay, he's calling out Bret Hart. And he says, I love my brother Stevie Ray. You do your thing, I'll do mine. I say, okay, uh, so Stevie's in the NWO. He's not going to fight with him. All right, that's fine. And he says, somebody whacked me in the knee and took me out. And I thought, what? They showed clips later. When they showed clips, I remembered it, but that was like three months ago, and they haven't mentioned it since. They just see this on NXT this week. Like, show us the clips before the guy makes his comment. Yeah. He revealed he had been attacked by Scott Hall, which I suspect they made up this day. He ch- said, challenge Hall to a match in the ring, and if Hall wouldn't do that, then Booker would go get him backstage. And then he says, I'm going to kick you where the good Lord split you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's on like neck bone tonight. And I thought, this is why wrestling sucks today, because nobody is ever going to write shit like that for anybody. That's true. That's what made wrestling great. Guys saying funny shit in their promos. Scott Putsky versus Fit Finley. Need I say any more? Uh, I believe we're in a rut here of fun matches that mean absolutely nothing. Oh, there's two more. There's a lot more, probably. There was a funny spot here. I actually, before you get to the funny spot, there's a fan in the front row, little old lady, sign that says, almost 90 and still a fan of NWA WCW. Wow. I thought that was NWA awesome. NWA WCW. That's what they wrote. Yep. <laughs> That's tremendous. I haven't been with the NWA for like five years at this point. <laughs> so, uh, so... Putsky's making a comeback, and Finley goes to the ropes, and he's leaning against the ropes. He's got his hands on the top rope, and clearly, he wants Putsky to grab him by the feet and lift him up and give him the big slam. Right. And Putsky can't get this message. (laughs) And time freezes. And I was just waiting for Finley to just shout, grab my feet! And eventually, Putsky figured it out, and they did the spot, and they went on. And Finley ducked the Polish hammer, hit a rolling fireman's carry, hit a tombstone for the win. Hey, Listen, I get, I understand why this lost the ratings. I get why this quarter hour was thumped by Ross quarter hour. This one, all of them. Point being, I don't care. I had fun watching this show. Yeah, there were, this was, there was nothing wrong with this. No. Except that it was boring. It was not boring. <laughs> it was, it was, I needed some action. We got lots of action. Give me some, <laughs> give me some real action, then a couple prelims, then some action. It was action, but it didn't mean anything. It was just it was meaningless. meaningless action, but it was action. Yeah, I need, I need some meaning. Raven was doing a promo in the shadows backstage, quoting Chris Christopherson. Yeah, well, it was a 
What song was the band was he in? Oh crap! Why did you? I don't know, but my mom was a huge fan of Chris Christopherson. But Highwaymen, Almond Brothers, forget. He was scoring song lyrics. Craig's gonna look it up now. All I know is he's in the shadows in the locker room, like he usually is, and then a human being arrives. It's Canyon. Well, I found out by the end it was Canyon, but you could tell immediately listening to his voice. No, uh, it's pretty. I was, I was aware it was a, a a male human, and he's talking, and Raven says, "Leave me alone, Canyon." Because no one could have turned the light on. And Raven walks out and Kenya follows him. We had a Jericho and not Goldberg video package. And Sonny Ono and the cat came out for a promo. I gotta admit, Chat's promos are kind of funny. They're funny. I mean, he called they're, some they're, woman they're, fat, they're... said she was taking up eight seats. Yes. Just to be a dick. They're, they're, they're cheap and easy, but they're funny. So he calls the fans fat and homeless, dares anyone from the back to come and fight him. Out comes Scott Armstrong. WWE referee Scott Armstrong accepts the challenge. That's right. And Kat says, I whipped you once before. I'm going to give you five seconds to leave. And he turns his back and starts to count, but Armstrong jumps in from behind. The match is on. The bell rings. Ten seconds later, Kat has pinned Scott Armstrong with a kick. I was so mad because, like, <laughs> I wanted to see Scott wrestle. And he didn't at all. He did like a uh, drop kick. Yeah. And Steve Armstrong comes in, and I'm like, these Armstrongs are jacked. Oh, yeah. Look at this family. Holy smokes. And he beats him up as well. And then Shad says, I whip the entire Armstrong family. I want the bullet next. Please let this happen. I please was begging. They've got to do Shat versus Bullet. Hey, please do it in 2017. Sure. I would love to see Bullet Bob and the Cat. Bullet Bob and the Cat. This is like the best match ever. The other part of this, Scott, Arm Scott Armstrong, I believe, was the fifth best wrestler in his own family. But when he came out to make the save for his brother, that had to be the biggest pop of his whole career. Probably, yeah. And then Cat killed him. Wrath versus Kendall Wyndham. Kendall didn't fuck anything up here, did he? Oh, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> All right. This goddamn match sucked. Okay. Kendall looked horrible here. I mean, maybe he didn't fuck anything up, but, like, he had that match a week ago or whatever where he actually looked okay. This was, like, two weeks ago, whoever it was against. I've already forgotten. It was Dale Torbo. Too much shit happening. Oh, God. But, like, he was goddamn terrible here. He was absolutely atrocious. Meltdown finish. This sucked. What the fuck were you watching? It was terrible. It sucked. Craig, any thoughts? Dude, it's... <laughs> He's you can say no. He's a glorified jobber. He's no good. Okay. And he looks just like his brother. Okay. Facially, he does look exactly like his brother. Yes. But it, it's Raph, and, and he... Well, he did his job. Okay. Clips of Bret Hart attacking DDP months ago. Then attacking him a few weeks ago. Oh, man. Then attacking him on this. Thunder. Then suddenly he's fighting Sting. There was no commentary for any of this. I had no idea what was going on or what I had to do with tonight's show. Yeah, but the Hearts are the stars of both shows. Well, that's not a surprise. This Bret Hart promo... It's coming. The line where he doesn't know if Gene Okerlund even has a groin. That hasn't happened yet, has it? <laughs> There's none of the show. It's the fucking best line ever. So he's got a groin pull. He says the doctors won't let him wrestle tonight. And Brett's cutting a promo, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> Gene doesn't believe him. Says, I saw you backstage. You were moving around great. Brett cannot believe that Gene would question his integrity. Gene's trying to get him hurt again. Doctors won't let him wrestle Lex Luger tonight. His promo is just... Brett is now, he has achieved nirvana when you don't give a fuck. You've totally <laughs> given up, and you're suddenly awesome. He's so great right now. It's promo about his groin. It is doctors and Luger. I loved it. Luger should count his blessings. He doesn't have to wrestle me tonight. I'd kick his ass. I liked when he said, he talked about hurting Sting and hurting DDP. So says, I'm going to hurt more people simply because I don't like him. Yeah. He says, DDP, I taught you a very valuable lesson. Don't celebrate your win in the ring. Hmm. Because he jumped him like an asshole. Right. But it was a lesson. This is a perfect heel. DDP made a mistake... By beating Brett and celebrating. Yes. He should have beaten Brett and then left the Don't ring Don't celebrate until you get to the back, he says. That's mm. right. Yes. So Lex Luger comes out in a custom-cut V-neck Wolfpack shirt. 
Gotta get that pet cleavage out there. And a belly shirt. And, and, and cut high to show his belly as well. So he accuses Brett of faking an injury to get out of the match. He says, Brett, you're not the best there ever was. You're the best at being a liar. I really, burn, dude. I really did like Lex here. <laughs> I did too. Like, Lex is a guy who's all ready for his match, and he knows this guy is lying, and he knows he's backing out, and he's just like, he, it's just preposterous to him. He's trying to egg him into the match. So, finally, Lex calls Brett a gutless coward, and he attacks him. In the process, Gene Oakland is struck by an errant blow. <laughs> and I saw a tweet from you earlier in the afternoon, Brian. We talked about watching this over and over again, and I thought he's got to be exaggerating. No. I owe you an apology. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I cared enough. I am on a very, very limited, like... Your time is tight. It is very, very tight watching five hours of wrestling. So the idea that I'm going to rewind something when watching these shows, but man, over and over <laughs> and over and over, and then going on Twitter to tweet about it. This was the funniest fucking thing this was funnier than Steve Blackman's giant kick to the chest of Owen Hart backstage. Luger goes for a clothesline, and he hits Brett. Mm -hmm. And, the, like, the first time I see it, you just see the clothesline, and then Gene's down. Yeah. And and Tony goes, he clipped Gene! And I'm like, fuck, I gotta see this. Right. And you go back, and like, okay, let me see the clipping. He fucking didn't come anywhere near Gene. No. <laughs> He clotheslines Brett, and for some reason that I, I absolutely cannot explain, Gene just throws both arms in the air and goes, ah, <laughs> and takes a bump. And he falls down, and he sells it like he's suffered a serious injury. Yeah. There's like five referees right there to tend to Gene. And over and over I watched it. Just the, I'm like, why did you fall down? <laughs> like, what the fuck's going on here? The, the, the wind off of the arm being thrown. So there wasn't even wind. Team. It was like it was like he was so scared. <laughs> like all of a sudden, this giant man is running at Bret Hart, and he just fucking freaks out. So here's what I think happened. <laughs> I think they planned this, and obviously didn't look as good as they th hoped. Okay. Because if you watch, Lex says Bret is a gutless coward, and then Lex like takes a step back to bounce off the ropes. So there's a delay of about a second or a second and a half setting it up. While that's going on, Gene is talking to Brett, but he's looking more at Lex because Gene knows this is his moment, and you can see Gene psyching himself up. <laughs> and then Lex waves his arm by in front of Gene to hit Brett. Brett goes down, and as Brian noted, Gene throws his hands and his face to the heavens <laughs> in deference to the Lord above. And it was seriously like the Lord was coming. And, yeah. and apparently he repented because then he fell to his knees in prayer. And I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed, and I watched it over and over again. So Gene's now, not going to be on the show next week. He may have been killed. He, okay. may, he, may, have, he may have undergone the rapture. Okay. There's more. Lex, because he's an asshole, takes his cruelly hurt Canadian and puts him up in the torture rack. And as he's got him in the torture rack, uh, Tony Schiavone screams, How about that groin now? <laughs> well... <laughs> it probably hurts more. I love this groin storyline. <laughs> it's the best. So, Geeks made the save. Brett rolled outside, selling his groin. They go to break. The announcers outright say, We are being forced by Eric Bischoff to show more Ric Flair wrestling. It is Hulk Hogan beating up Flair at the Halloween Havoc cage match with Mr. T as ref. They may have shown the whole match. It went on for a long time. Four Horsemen came out for a promo. Arn runs down Eric, says he's a liar, he's got a lot of power. You're insulting Hogan and Flair by making a joke out of the great matches. Barry's Bischoff for going hunting in Montana rather than fighting the Horsemen here. And Flair talks about how great they are for a while. Malenko and Benoit say, you guys go start the party. we got a match to take care of, but we'll join you later. And that was that, and I just thought, this is the absolute peak of the Attitude Era. Steve Austin and DX running wild on one channel, and the NWO and the Wolfpack running wild here. The Horsemen seem so out of place, well, especially as babyfaces. Yeah, that's sad. The problem is they brought them back, and they were just like the hottest act. And they have not done jack shit with them. No. I do love that. So, Arn cuts a great promo, and Flair cuts a great promo. And the most polite thing I could say is Dean and Benoit spoke. 
Yeah. <laughs> and then Flair goes, we found him. Mongo. Yes. Yeah. I actually remember this. He was it, lost in Las Vegas. It was legitimate that they went to Vegas and Mongo just went all horsemen. <laughs> Got lost. Didn't show up in Nitro and was just like gone. He was wow. AWOL. And in fact, they found him. And <laughs> Flair says he's alive and well. He was half right. He's alive. He was under a hooker. And he may have still been right. drunk wow. because he just cut the weirdest fucking promo. I did. I, I just wrote. I, all I wrote was Mongo ran down Bischoff for a while. All I wrote was he may have still been drunk. I didn't even try well, to this recap is, this promo. That would explain some of his later actions, as we shall get to. May I, Vince? Okay. Next match: Scott Norton versus Van Hammer. IWGP Heavyweight Champion Scott Norton. Thank you. Before you be angry, Craig. Sure. I just want to say, between the end of the what the hell was it? The what was it? whatever the last match was, I can't even find it now. It was a long. It was Wrath between the end of the Wrath match and the start of this match. Twenty five minutes went by plus commercials. Wow. There was a half hour of nothing. Now, carry on. So, Scott Norton's a beast. Yes. He splashes Van Hammer in the stiffest manner possible. Yes. Van Hammer takes a powder, and he's near the guardrail, and there's two little kids in the front row. And as Vaz ha Van Hammer is on the floor, on his face, this little kid sticks his foot through the guardrail and stomps him three, four, five times. <laughs> stomps on Van Hammer's leg. I died. I tweeted out a picture. Check it out. Yeah, they were not intimidated by Van Hammer at all. Now, that half-hour wait... It was totally worth it to watch Scott Norton kill this fucker. <laughs> he just beat him and beat him and beat him. Gave one comeback, hit a Samoa drop and a powerbomb, and this powerbomb, I believe, was a shoot. <laughs> he just grabbed this giant hippie, hoisted him all the way up to the sky, and slammed him back down to earth with ease. It was like the best match of Scott Norton's career. It was great. It was awesome. He didn't even need the kid's help. No, he did not need that child's help. By the way, there were also some Nitro Party clips in there. And these guys, these, uh, it was a pool party, and they had girls there, so it was better than most. <laughs> Brett was backstage getting his ribs taped. Brian, you mentioned this was a three-hour show. I think a half hour was just ribs being taped here. Yeah. Went on for a while. They cut to the ring. Saturn's already out there. Dude, this fucking segment. <laughs> so, Saturn's in the ring, and he goes, Eddie, I want you to come out here and fight me one-on-one. -on -one. All right, fine. That's cool. So, Eddie runs down, and he hits the ring, and they start fighting. No bell. No. Mm -hmm. So, they're fighting, and they're fighting, and they're fighting, and then, next thing you know, a ref gets in the ring, and the ref is motioning for them to get out of the ring. Like, yeah. get out of here, you guys. Yes. Like, there's no match. Right. No bell, no match. Yes. Tell them to get out of the ring. Yes. They keep fighting. Saturn does a top rope leg drop on Eddie in this brawl. Yes. He makes a cover, and now the goddamn referee drops down and starts counting. Yeah. yeah. Eddie kicks out. <laughs> yes. Then the LWO runs in, and they hit the ring, and someone rings the fucking bell. This all happened. They ring the bell to end a match that never started. That's correct. <laughs> this what? Is the, the opposite of what happened on Raw. Raw matches will start and not end. Here matches... End, but it will start. Maybe the raw match has started, and this was the belt endum. This Let's was the see. finish to the raw match. God, this was so stupid. Speaking of stupid, Conan came out looking oh. like one of Pitbull's backup dancers. If Conan came out in his club gear, I do want to say, by the way, before we move on, when Eddie came out to respond to Saturn's challenge, one of the things he said was, "I'm going to show you what Latinoism is all about." Right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not a word. Hey, you want pretty great sure. lines? Do not bury this Conan Eddie segment. Conan called Eddie a punk Mark Busta, to which Eddie called him an Anglo-punk Wolfpack buddy. That happened. Or he talked about his Anglo-punk Wolfpack his buddies. Anglo buddies, yes. Oh, this was amazing. Can you imagine someone writing that nowadays? <laughs> no. Eddie, you're going to call him a punk Mark Buster. Okay. So, well, no one wrote this. They wrote it for themselves. So, yes, Conan basically, is, Conan told Saturn... Eddie is doing to these guys what Raven did with the flock. I'll handle this. And Saturn relented and he left. So it was all Conan and Eddie shouting at each other. The funny thing is, Eddie's got the Latino world order. And Conan is the one with the Anglo buddies hanging out with the wolf pack. 
But Conan, of course, he's a Cuban, I believe. Puerto Rican? I think so. Yeah, but uh, he has an actual accent. His vo- his natural speaking voice has an accent to it. Eddie, if you only watched him in uh, WWE, he's not from Mexico. He is from Texas. And his normal speaking voice, which he was using here at the Latino World Order, was perfect straight American English. So the Latino guy is yelling at the guy t- talking like the white guy. Anyway, everyone has <laughs> left. And on the way out, totally at random, Conan ran into then Mariner shortstop Alex Rodriguez. Yeah. And they left together. So weird. What was he doing in the aisle? Probably waiting for Tori Wilson to debut. Oh, good call. Uh, so we had Shaq on that show, and, or the Raw, and Alex on here. The next match was announced as Scott Steiner versus... Oh, my God. Chaos. And chaos is the operative word. Scott Steiner and Buff come out, and J.J. Dillon thinks now's a great time to come out and lay down the law on these two guys. He's out there with chaos. He's trying to talk, and Steiner just fucking snaps and goes after the guy. Now, (laughs) dude, he's screaming on national television that J.J. isn't going to do shit to him. Yep. Grabs a mic. He's screaming that WCW sucks. J.J. tries to join the announcers. They go to commercial and come back. I'm trying to remember exactly how this all went down. I believe he got to the announcers and they said... They ran for their lives. No, there was like... I'm trying to think about... Basically, something happened. And JJ ends up at the announcers and they go, You have something you want to say? Yes. He says, I yeah. Have, I have something to say. Yeah. They go to commercial, come back, he's gone. Yes. I think later, Scott chased the announcers away. There were, there were two... There are two st- crazy Scott Steiner yes, segments. So I, yes. I, 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 you're right. I am confused. He them. chased him away like Frankenstein chased villagers. But this guy was completely out of his mind. Yeah. For n- no on-camera storyline reason. Well, there is an on-camera reason. Look at him. <laughs> they got me there. <laughs> so, yeah. Whatever they had planned here, Scott changed the plans. And <laughs> they tried to get with him later. It's the really amazing thing. Psychosis versus Rey Mysterio Jr. Rey got new music. It's much better. So he had all kinds of big moves. Sky Psychosis doing the slingshot leg drop to the floor. Don't do that, everyone. Mm. Psychosis took most of the match. Rey making the occasional big comeback. And to be honest, some of it was ugly and fucked up to the point the announcers were saying, I think Rey made that move up on the fly. <laughs> Finally, Rey made his real comeback. The LWO came back out. Rey was distracted. Then when he tried to top rope Rana, Psychosis turned into a powerbomb for the win. This was not the Psychosis versus Ray, uh, the the matches of lore. Not you know the ECW what I mean? matches, no. So it was yeah. two guys who didn't care enough to go all out, but could have a good match going 25%. Yeah, so they that, did. That's what happened. It sucked, because I called Cameron in the room. I said, this is going to be good. And he was like, when are they going to start doing stuff? Oh, dear. Yeah. You've failed your son. Well, I got to show him the ECW stuff. Be very careful with that. Actually, the one from the Super Juniors tournament of that year before mm-hmm. was amazing. That's a better one to show him. Me and Gene brought Chris Jericho out for a promo. It's odd. Jericho's got his Goldberg t-shirt on. He is sarcastically, mockingly talking about the respect he has for Goldberg. Says, they are both ex-football players, which I don't think Gene saw coming because Gene cracked up. I love he calls him Gene Mean. Gene Mean. I think he saw him Iron Sheik, actually. Uh, cause he, uh, anyway, uh, he wished Goldberg the best in all his future endeavors, which had to be the first time that line was said, actually said on TV. And that was that. Dean Malenko and Raven. The good thing about this match was the announcers. They're in Florida. Flair makes a joke about how he's going to join the horsemen at South Beach. Shivani encourages him to leave and says, don't forget your bag. There's a pause and he says, She's over there. Shivani stops and says, Now that was unkind. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> so Raven, he's depressed about whatever. He wants Dean to beat him up. Yeah, we never found out what he was depressed about. He's no. Just, he's just moody. Like, even by Raven standards, he's sadder than usual. He's depressed in the corner. And... and So he says, hit me in the... Go ahead and hit me, Dean. And Dean beats the fuck out of him. And Tony says, don't tell the horseman to hit you. Heenan says, don't tell anyone to hit you. <laughs> and Shivani says, well, I agree with that. <laughs> they were on fire here. 
Then things got weird. They're brawling on the floor. Lodi runs out with a sign reading, Raven, why are you doing this to yourself? Now, can anyone tell me at any point in the history of WCW, was there a conflict between the four horsemen and the flock? Fuck if I know. I couldn't tell you. For I mean, no reasons, an ad major. No reasons I can think of. I don't think any reasons I can invent. Mongo is suddenly at ringside with a cat of nine tails. Mongo goes after Lodi, uses the cat of nine, nine cat of nine tails to whip the shaved, tan, muscular, shirtless man in the leather shorts back up the ramp. Well, you know, when when it first happened, I was like, "Why the fuck is this guy here?" But the simple answer was, there doesn't need to be a storyline between the flock and the horsemen. There was a match, and Dean Malenko was being double teamed, so his horseman buddy came out to even the odds. Why he had that fucking thing, he was in Vegas. That's the only thing I can come up with. Okay. You have to pay extra for that, I've heard. (laughs) So the match continues. Dean makes a comeback. Now Canyon's out there. Canyon attacks Dean, but Dean kicks Raven into him. Match keeps going. Benoit's out there. He's running with Canyon. Now Bret Hart's out there. He attacks Benoit. Somewhere in here, Malenko won with a cloverleaf, and as soon as the bell rings, Canyon grabs him. It's a flatliner. They literally... I mean... You recapped it, but here's my notes. Raven tries the DDT. Malenko reverses. Goes for the cloverleaf. Canyon runs down. Several near falls. Benoit runs down. Benoit goes after Canyon. Bret goes after Benoit. Puts him in a Khmer outside. Bell rings. I think Malenko won with a cloverleaf. Luger comes down, yep. goes after Brett, who had been one of Kimura. Giant runs down, saves Brett. This was a fucking goddamn mess, all in caps. Did I miss anything? No. This, this sucked. What I wrote was this whole segment was a big mess and nobody cared about the match. What a disaster. Come yeah. on, guys. This was, yeah. Kidman versus Chris Jericho. This is another one of those weird matches. So they went to a time limit draw. Mm-hmm. They went to a 10-minute time limit draw. Mm-hmm. In 8 minutes and 12 yes, seconds sure. or whatever. So, here's what's so bizarre about it. First off, nobody gave a shit about Kidman. They killed him when he got destroyed by Hall. He's never recovered. No one cares about the match for like 5 minutes. They finally get into it in the final 2 minutes. So, they don't really go 10 minutes. They go like 8-12. Right? Sure. Okay. Why didn't you ring the bell like in the middle of a hot near fall? Right. Like, Kidman climbs up to the top rope, and they ring the bell. Yeah. He's He hadn't even jumped yet. They just completely out of nowhere rang the bell at a completely random time in this alleged 10-minute draw. Do you think it's a, a, a thing where you guys go, the time limit, well, how long do we got? We got 10 minutes. And nobody told them when they were going to ring the bell? I mean, clearly. Because otherwise they would have hit... A couple of finishers, there's been some roll-ups. Like hit something. one move and ring the bell in the middle of it or something. When the referee's at two, they just rang the bell. And it wasn't even a very good match. It was it was all right by the end, but mm-hmm. then we had the Scott Steiner promo. Okay. So they're gonna try this storyline again. They go come back from commercial, they cut show the announce desk, Dylan is there, chaos is there. Dylan gets as far as saying Buff Bagwell is fined fifty thousand dollars. And Scott Steiner is fined 100 thou. At this point, Scott Steiner comes running out of the back like a grizzly bear. He's going to kill everyone. Dude, not even a bear. Like, I saw a bear at the zoo. Scott was way, way scarier than that bear. The, the zoo bears are not the same as forest bears. And he goes for the announcers, and they all have to run for their lives. Like, they're legitimately oh, scared. I guarantee yeah. you Bobby Heenan was pissing himself. Exactly. Like, poor Bobby Heenan is trying to jump over stuff to get the hell out of there. Probably holding, holding legit his scared for his life. And then Scott goes to the ring. Would you like to cut the promo, Vinny? I don't want the drop. <laughs> So, yeah, Scott decides it's time to get a promo. Buff is out there legit trying to cool him down. Mm-hmm. Scott's having none of it. So, Scott's talking about how WCW sucks. Nobody there can control the rage inside of him. And he starts going off on Roddy Piper. Haven't seen Piper in months. Don't recall ever seeing Piper and Steiner on camera together. Nope. But something happened. He decides. He says, with great difficulty. It took him like four tries to get this out. But he calls... Scott Steiner calls Roddy Piper, that's his words, not mine, a skirt-wearing queer. And as soon as he says this, 
Buff drops his head. Like, oh, no. <laughs> so Scott adds that WCW can kiss his ass. Well, I guess I'm going to have to do it. This is what he actually said with great difficulty. Thank you. He said Rowdy Roddy Piper was a skirt-wearing queer on Queer Street and liking it. See, I couldn't even... That's understand. what he got out. I couldn't even understand that part. Well... I, I listened like three times and I never got it because he was mumbling so bad. That's, that's what he said with great, great difficulty. Mm-hmm. And Bagwell is, in fact, trying to get this guy to just calm down. So he steals the mic and he tries to, he tries to calm him down by diverting the focus and attention. I'm going to talk about Kenny Chaos now, he says. He says, none of this is Chaos's fault. He just caught between two brothers. He just wants Chaos to come out so they can talk. Okay, listen. I know it's fake. Okay. <laughs> Kenny fucking Chaos is the dumbest motherfucker <laughs> in the whole world. Scott is just going fucking batshit crazy. Yeah. And Bagwell goes, what you want to talk, Kenny? <laughs> come on down to the ring. Let's just have a chat. Mm-hmm. So... Guess what happens? But well, let's go through the whole thing because before Kenny can even appear, Scott steals the mic back. Now he's going off. Says a lot of people get airtime because they kiss butt. I have never kissed butt and I never will. I'm legit. At this point, a very terrified Kenny Chaos emerges in his wrestling trunks and flip flops. He is in no hurry to get in the ring, but I guess they got a plan. And he's going to stick to it. So Buff tries to act respectful. Scott murders him from behind. <laughs> Buff begins to cackle. They put Chaos in the recliner. He repeats that WCW sucks. The guys in the NWO do what they want whenever they want. And they leave. I thought Chaos got off easy. He really did, but... I think he's tear his arm I mean, as off. a character, I mean, you can't be any dumber. Well, no. I mean, this is Geek of the Year for 1998. <laughs> Which covers a lot of ground. It covers a lot of ground. Scott Hall versus Booker T. It's a good match. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is okay. Hall was not drunk. No, he just stopped being drunk all of a sudden. Got in there, worked his ass off, and then they had an absolutely shit finish. Like always. See, I thought this was me. It may have been because it was three hours into the show, Ah, but this is boring. There was a fight in the crowd that got more heat than the fight in the ring. It looked like two guys who had not worked together much and were just idiot-proofing everything for each other. So, eventually, eventually Booker hit a missile dropkick, Hall pulled the ref in the way, and another ref ran out to call for the DQ. Well, that was lame. Little did I know. In the main event, Giant versus Lex Luger. Okay. Holy shit. You thought the last match was boring? Holy shit. Oh, my God. You know what's so funny, too, is Giant's on his way out. Clearly. He's right. going. He's done. To WWE. But he's so fat. <laughs> he gets fatter every single week. You would think that if he was sick of this shit and he was getting ready to leave and go to WWE... He'd be working to get in shape. Sure. Instead, he's getting fatter. He's fattening up for his WWE run. Now, I know you're not supposed to tamper with contracts and things like that, and you're not supposed to... They did. Okay. All throughout the 90s. <laughs> so he knew he was, sides. he knew he was going to WWF. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he decided to... Yeah. Check out. Yep. That's silly. Yep. So, as I'm watching this seven-hour match <laughs> of a tall man, lean on a lean man, a muscular man, all I can think is, where the hell are the stars of this company? There is no Hogan. There is no Nash. There is right. no Bischoff. To this point, there have been no Goldberg. Did, well, we know that Bischoff was hunting. Apparently. And maybe Goldberg was hunting. Scott Hall, in the previous match, said that he left Nash in that little hole in the wall. So, he's still in the other arena. From last week. A week later. So, Giant was giving 5% at the very most here. I mean, he's being very generous. Just stomping him. He's standing on him. And then, when Lex gets to his feet, Giant's, he's so lazy, he won't even punch or chop or do a clip on for him. He pushes Lex, and Lex goes down. This was, this was one of the worst matches of the whole year. <laughs> there wasn't, like, something involving Warrior and Magic. <laughs> at least Warrior was trying. Which, by the way, like, I think that's the end of the Warrior. Yeah. Oh, he's done. Until, yeah. Yep. That, I mean, last week was actually good. Yes. He and then up, they got rid of him. He went on a high note. Oh, my God. Yeah, we don't see him again until the Hall of Fame. I'm just, my mind is boggled. So this match sucks and sucks and sucks. And then Brett runs. I, I will say this, though. After 15 minutes of just 
nap inducing wrestling. Lex makes his comeback and he signals to the rack and everyone they jumps go nuts. to the feet. It's yeah. astounding. There is no match so shitty that this crowd won't pop for Lex's finish at the end. It's Lex, amazing. Lex is one of those guys, the more I watch, the more I realize that everybody dropped the ball on Lex. Oh, clearly. Everybody, like, you can say that he wasn't a great promo and he wasn't a great worker, but, I mean, you can just watch, like, when he won the title a Nitro, like, a year ago or whatever, and, you know, every time he does something, they just go batshit crazy for him, and yes. then, they, then they pull the rug out from under every single time. On that note... Lex does not get to rack the giant because Bret Hart runs in with a, a piece of guardrail or something and attacks him for the cheap DQ. They're working him over. Goldberg is, in fact, here. They flew this guy to wherever the fuck they were, the biggest star in the company. They sat him down backstage for two hours and 59 minutes. They send him running out there. He spears the giant. He goes to spear Bret. Bret pulls Lex in the way, and that's the end of the show. That's what they did with Bill Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, that's what they did with Goldberg. Can you imagine? <laughs> I can, but still. Listen, there was some there was some good professional wrestling matches on this show, but this show sucked. This show sucked. The more I look back over it, I have to agree you're right. It just sucked. <laughs> like, it was the exact opposite of Raw. Like, Raw, there was just too much shit going on, but at least, like, there was too much. <laughs> Which, I mean... If you're just trying to be entertained, too much, I guess, is better than too little. Because this was three boring-ass hours of pro wrestling, and it died in the ratings. Well, since I did it for the other show, I must do this. Finishes. Clean pin. Pin after one guy left the ring to chase a manager. Clean pin. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Okay. Clean pin, maybe two, if you count both Armstrongs. Clean pin, clean pin. DQ due to gang running after a match that never really started. Pin after distraction by a dozen guys. Clean submission, though there were a half dozen other things going on and nobody noticed. Time limit draw. Intentional DQ and DQ due to Canadian running in with a guardrail. Yep. <laughs> Apparently that YouTube has been playing the entire time we've been doing the show. <laughs> now then. This Nitro. You didn't like it? Did not. Really? That mention it sold out in three hours legitimately. The hardest time I have staying awake. <laughs> oh, come on. How could you fall asleep during this show? Oh. Oh, goodness. Are you Easily. kidding me? Dude. Two hours and 20 minutes. Whew. Yeah. Nitro number 166, November 9th, 1998. The show opened with a video saying the line between pro wrestling and politics was very, blur very blurry. Just wait, people. Just wait. Hulk Hogan, they said, would start a campaign for president tonight. And why not? Bobby Heenan and Gene Oakland were backstage awaiting, and I quote, the president of the United States. Yeah. So in The Observer, Dave said that they promised that Bill Clinton would show up. Mm -hmm. Never. They never said Bill Clinton's name. They no. said president. They said the president. Of the United States. Of the United States was going to be here tonight. So, two limos pull up, the NWO guys get out, they all fight with each other, and it led to nothing. Can I add, by the way, that I couldn't even believe this. So, at the beginning of the show, they announced the President of the United States is going to show up tonight, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure everybody was presuming it was bullshit, but maybe there was like that little, tiny little part of them that thought, you know what, maybe for some reason, like the President will do the Tonight Show or whatever... Jay Leno has been on the show. Maybe. You know what I mean? They were in New York. It is believable Bill Clinton wanted to introduce himself to Miss Elizabeth. And bye -bye then bye. Gene announces that the NWO has reported that the president is going to be on Nitro. Why would you do that? I mean, can you possibly give away that is bullshit any more than that? And everybody involved looked like such an idiot. For believing the NWO that the president was going to be on Nitro. We got like five minutes of Bret Hart highlights. Who and Tudor Guerrero? Oh, there was there was a lot of highlights. Did there we mention Hall attacking Nash? Lot. Well, the NWO fought. 
Yeah. Did we mention a thousand fanny packs running to make the save? <laughs> I, not, I, I didn't know. I could not believe how many fanny packs. I've never seen a segment with more fanny packs than this one right here. Every fucking guy running up had a fanny pack on. There was like 35 fanny packs in one segment. I haven't seen that many fanny packs at the fair. <laughs> then, yes. Every Bret Hart highlight from his entire career here. Juventud Guerrero versus Kaz Hayashi. Oh, my God. Dude. First, they cut away from the match so Eric Bischoff can ambush the announcers <sighs> and say, Over the house, Mike. The president will be here tonight. And there was also a bullshit finish, but at least... I, I thought it was going to be like the TNA pay-per-view, where there was a match going on, but they focused on other stuff the entire time. These guys got like five minutes in between. Actually, more went through a commercial break. They had a long time to wrestle. Dude, they had, they had a long match. Yeah. And it hit me. In a lot of ways, this was very similar to like a modern ROH match. Yeah. But the, the biggest difference was... Kaz got like three or four minutes to do his stuff, and then Hoovy got three or four minutes to do his stuff... Unlike ROH, where they just take turns, move after move after move, and everything is countered right away. So this actually felt like a fight where one guy was winning, and then the tables were turned, and the other guy had the advantage for a while. Dude, this match was so great. And it has to be... I mean, maybe there's another one, but I'm pretty sure this was the best match I've ever seen that got a boring chant. Yeah, there was one guy. How in the fuck? And they were shading for Goldberg and shit like that. This match was so good, and nobody cared. Yeah. And then out comes Ernest fucking Miller. Cat and Sonny Ono come out. Cat takes the ref. Ono kicks Kaz in the face. I've heard that Ernest Miller is a three-time karate champion. That is the gimmick. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Ono kicks Kaz in the face, and Hoovy wins the, with a roll-up. So the karate champion didn't kick him in the face. His manager did. Well, his manager is also a karate champion. I see. Yes. He, 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 he emphasized this, and he's been saying he's the... He is the undefeated. Uh, he's undefeated and the best Japanese wrestler in uh, in WCW. You know, I have never seen a match so good that filled me with so much hate. <laughs> That's fair. It was astonishing. Between Bischoff coming out and mm -hmm. boring chance and this bullshit finish and the shad, it was just shit. <laughs> we got a replay of the angle where Nash was thrown through a wall and disappeared. That was a good angle. <laughs> Alex Wright versus Barry Horowitz. In a match I thought we had just seen. But no, it was Barry Horowitz versus Disco Inferno. I love that Alex Same Wright thing. comes out and says, I demand complete silence for my match with Barry Horowitz. Specifically, Brian, what he said was, he did not want to hear any Alex Wright chant sucks. <laughs> Alex oh, yeah? Wright chant sucks? That's what he wants. That's what he said. So yes, the announcer explained, and this is also a quote, Alex Wright demands total silence so he can devote complete attention to defeating Barry Horowitz. Well, luckily he's not over, so laughed, no problem. And I laughed, and I laughed. So, I hope you wrote down the finishes for this show. Oh, I did. <laughs> so, Secret Service dudes right there at ringside now. They start brawling on the floor. The wolf pack howl sounds. Just, oh, yeah. Just the howl. And everyone looks around. And then the wolf pack comes out, and then the wolf pack music plays. Nash comes out so pissed off. <laughs> Because they just, they can't even play fucking music right. <laughs> it's coming out, they play the music, and it was just, this was so incredible. Nash gets in the ring, and he's acting all friendly to Barry, and he pats him on the ass, Yeah, gives him the old thumbs up. Hit the showers, kid. Sends him packing. I'm like, you're such a dick. <laughs> like, they came out to announce matches for later. Uh-huh. Kinda. They wouldn't allow Barry Horowitz to finish his match. No. It's like, your match is not important. You're a jabroni. They were right. But we're going to be, like, really nice to you. We're going to pat you on the ass and give you a thumbs up and everything like that. It's just, it was just like, I, I don't know. What so, am, I don't even care. There was no, I don't know why I'm even caring. There was no bell. They just left, and these guys started talking. Conan did his catchphrases. Nash quoted Popeye. Challenged anyone from the black and white, but especially Scott Hall. Luger calls out Brett. Bischoff comes out. Nash repeatedly calls him Estrogen Boy. Yeah. Was there an inside joke here, Brian? I'm sure there was, but I don't fucking know what it was. You know what this was? When you're sitting in your dad's chair watching his TV and he gets home from work, and then basically you just have to get out of his way. Oh, I'm in dad's chair. I got to move. Here's the... Here's so the, who's dad here? The, end, the Wolfpack? Absolutely. I see. Okay, that's fine. So, 
Bischoff and Nash go back and forth, and when it was done, I wrote, Bischoff booked, then I realized I didn't know what had happened. I think a six-man? Well, he just promised that they would face the black and white tonight. W- would it be that hard for him to specify it here? No. Yes. They probably hadn't written it yet. <laughs> well, it was announced after the break. It would be Conan versus Bret Hart, and Nash and Luger versus Giant and Hall. Lodi versus Scott Norton. Oh, I was kidding. You know what's funny about this is every time WWE fucks somebody up and I say, you know what? All you have to do is just let them go out there and kill some folks and win a lot. Yeah. And everybody goes, not everybody, but, you know, the usual crew, that doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work. Or whatever. You can't do that. You can't blah, 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 blah. It fucking works every time I see it. Mm-hmm. Scott fucking Norton out here. Scott's- was like the biggest star on the show because he came out and destroyed Lodi. Scott has been a mid-card at best guy for the entire Nitro run. An NWO black and white geek faction member. Yes. Yeah, you're right. That's correct. But he comes out here. It's been like a month now. He destroys guys in a minute. Looks like a monster. Hits a big giant power move and pins him. He wrath. Be- also works with Wrath. It fucking works for everybody. It's a big... New Japan gold belt doesn't hurt either. He is introduced while well, the announcers call him the IWGP world champion. That does, in fact, help. He destroyed Lodi with a power bomb in like 10 seconds. And between this monster push he's getting here and the fire and ice feud with the Steiners, really hit me how underrated Scott Norton is in the Monday Night He's Wars. awesome. He's awesome. This next segment, you're all going to think I'm lying about what happened. If you told me well, this happened before I watched the show, I just said, bullshit. You must have watched the wrong program. (laughs) The Disciple comes out for a promo. Gene Gene says, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Disciple. And you can hear the crowd, all 10,000 people kind of go, Disciple comes out. It's Brutus Beefcake in 1998. There are beefcake chants. He gets as far as saying he is his own man when out comes the biggest crew of losers... The B team to end all B teams. Stevie Ray, Horace, and Vincent. And they come out to interrupt. And I'm just looking at these four men. Beefcake, Stevie Ray, Horace, and Vince. Hey, think about this. It's Horace, Vincent, and Stevie Ray. Okay? As stated. You're the booker. (laughs) You're the booker. Okay. Somebody needs to go back and forth with the disciple. I disagree, but okay. Who do you choose of those three men? It's got to be Stevie Ray, right? Yeah. yeah. The, I only, think so. the yeah. only guy that can cut anything resembling a decent promo. Uh-huh. Sure. Well, who do these fuck faces choose? It was Horace. Horace. Actually, it wasn't the worst choice. It, it was, was it was the middle choice. Yeah, it was they the figured wrong out choice. they figured out not Vincent. There was a wronger choice, but this is the wrong choice. Horace notes that he was bigger, tougher, and uglier than the disciple. That's what he <laughs> because said. you know that's you know part of the that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> disciple then tells Horace, "Quote, get out of my face before I rearrange it." Yeah, he's gonna rearrange his own face. <laughs> yeah. Get well, out of my face once. before I rearrange it. So Horace attacks Disciple, and Tanae says, Ah, oh, this was a pre-planned attack. You think? This goes on for he a while. He is the professor. Brutus Beefcake makes his comeback in 1998. The NWO eventually swarms him with one of the worst dis- offensive displays I can recall. Do you remember, Brian, when you and I had a match with Buddy Wayne and Richie Magnet, and they told you to tell me whatever he was doing with his arm, stop it? Yes. I believe the punches I was throwing at that match were very similar to what Vincent was doing here. Probably better. <laughs> I was in, like, my, I don't know, 20th match. Vince has been a pro in this for, like, decades at this point. Anyway, it sucks. And who should come out to make the save? I could not believe my eyes. <laughs> what is he doing here? He's back again. It's Warrior. He won't leave. <laughs> Well, actually, this was for real this time. The end. Are this you was sure? this was his last appearance. I'd have never come back too. Yeah, he ran down and he cleared the ring. And actually, he wasn't horrible clearing the ring, given his opponents. It was. But and God, him. He, he sprints down that ramp, and by the time he throws his first clothesline, he is gasping for air. Yes. 
And the, they go to commercial as he is sticking his t-shirt in horse's mouth, whipping him in. And How much did he get paid for this one show? Well, I think, if I recall correctly, he got like a million dollars, and then they like signed him for another million, but they never used him. <laughs> it was some like completely like, preposterous deal. This is deal. So, ran- so random and forgotten and pointless. The only thing I could figure was, they must have signed him to a deal with X number of dates, and they realized they had him for one more date, and God damn it, we're paying him, we're going to book him. And they did this. What a segment. I <laughs> none of the, Nothing else makes any sense. Heenan and Gene were backstage watching a motorcade arrive. So it arrives. All right, here we go. Yeah. Up to this point, this has just been a nitro. <laughs> you know what? This was not even the stupidest thing on the show. But at the time, <laughs> I thought this was the stupidest thing I'd maybe ever seen. <laughs> Beyond being the stupidest, it was quite clearly the worst. Which oh. is more important. They never do it again, by the way. There have been stupid segments that have been fun. This is not fun. Think about this. It was so fucking stupid. Even they realized, let's not do it again. They didn't figure that out with the warrior. <laughs> now, one other thing before you even recap it. Hulk Hogan is the top heel in this company. Right? Should be, yeah. Clearly. Okay, well, what happened here? Well, first we had the motorcade arriving. Then they went back to the announcer's. Then they go backstage where Secret Service is telling Gene and Bobby to step back. Then it goes back to the announcers. Then we get a mob of dorks in suits pushing the cameraman back. Then we go back to the announcers. It's just Larry, Tony, and Mike staring at the camera with puzzled expressions. This felt like it had already been 20 minutes in. Were they deliberately trying to lose this war? Did they all just want to retire and get out of this business and go home? Hail to the Chief begins to play. And out come Hogan and Bischoff. Dressed like an idiot, Eric notes. Or Larry noted, correct, correctly. He wasn't wrong. No. No. They hit the ring. Bischoff introduces Hogan as the next president of the United States. Got a flag dropping from the ceiling. Gene arrives to interview them. Hogan congratulates Jesse Ventura. Now, hold on here. Uh. Gene arrives. This was the most astonishing thing. <laughs> Gene arrives, and he's playing it straight. <laughs> yeah. He begins to interview Hulk Hogan about his presidential run in the year 2000. Hogan is sitting there. He congratulates Jesse. He's a true American. He says, Minnesota set a standard for this country. They chose a non-politician to put Minnesota back on track. I could not even believe this watching in 2017. By the way, he said this while wearing the most ridiculous white-rimmed glasses I've ever seen, <laughs> yeah, a stocking like, cap, yeah. and two feather boas, one black and one white. Like, think of how ridiculous he dresses every segment, and this is just a similar style, but cranked up to, like, 20. Dressed like an idiot, he was, as yeah, Larry like noted. Idiot. So then Hogan says, I got a ton of calls, including from Jesse, which I didn't pick up, <laughs> but I promise I'll call him back. I decided I am going to run for president. And if I could find one good American to run side by side with me, I'd do it. Whether it be Oprah or my brother Bubba. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my fucking... So to watch this in 2017, (laughs) Hulk Hogan running for president, putting over his brother Bubba. Bubba the love sponge. By the way, they promised he would announce his running mate. He didn't. He said Bubba. Because apparently in in the week that they'd come up with this idea, he could not legitimately find one person to even pretend that they would be Hulk Hogan's running mate. Nobody would do it. He had no running mate. And I swear to God, Gene Okerlund then fucking says, Hulk, are you going to run as a Republican or a Democrat? This had to be a shoot, right? I don't know. Hogan had no answer. He just starts bumbling around, committing to absolutely nothing. Maybe he didn't know that there was two political parties in this in the states. This was so god awful, and it was long. It went on this forever. Is the key. It started way back in that motorcade bit, and it went on through this promo. Twenty minutes of my life I will never ever get back. <laughs> like, what did Hogan think was going to happen here? He was going to get cheered. 
He's the top heel. I don't know. Out here acting like he's going to run for president and he's asking for our support? I don't know. <laughs> what the fuck was going on here? This was when I knew, like, dude's lost his mind. <laughs> he totally has lost his mind. And Bischoff has lost his mind. Everybody's lost their minds. The Nitro Girls went shopping. That was way better than this segment. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Bret Hart came out for a promo. He said he's not afraid of Luger. Have they played this music for Brett before? I don't think so. This music's awesome. Yeah. I remember. I do remember watching Nights with You at some point, and I would have fan you were of Brett's music, and it's been a year now since Brett's been in WCW, and his music wasn't that cool. And this music was really cool. Yeah, this is this is like, it, it was is, new this week, It must right? be this one. It was like a takeoff on his WWE Yeah, this, game, is, this was, was great music. Better. So Brett says he's not afraid of Luger. Tell Sting to get well soon so he can hurt him again, I think. DDP might as well just FedEx the U.S. belt back to his rightful owner. FedEx. Mm-hmm. He promised to take Conan out tonight and said the Nitro girls needed to start hiding. Yeah. What? Well, he said the <laughs> only he said. he said the only people not hiding from me are the Nitro girls, but they better start. So he's banging them. I don't know or what something. he. Was, I don't know what he was insinuating. All I know is he's totally given up and he's awesome now. <laughs> <laughs> so he's banging them, but they should be really afraid. It's basically what he said. I don't know. Eddie Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. If these guys wrestled 10,000 times and you rank them from 1 to 10,000, this would be number 10,001. They did nothing. It's true. Well, I mean, I will give it a little bit of credit. Like, Eddie did a great job working over the leg. Like, if you want to see how to technically work over a guy's leg, like, this was a good match. But who the fuck wants to watch Eddie Guerrero work over Rey Mysterio's leg? And then, Rey did, like, a little bit of limping... But he's running during his comeback. He's jumping. Bobby Heenan says, and I quote, Can you imagine a one-legged man doing all these springboard moves? That's what he said. <laughs> I'm like, fuck no, I can't imagine that. It's like two indie guys out there. So, Eddie is wrestling in a shirt now. And it is the LWO shirt, so maybe he's just trying to get that over and push it. Why but... does it have to be so big? Well, I don't know what his physical condition was. Okay. I know he had injuries in WCW. I know he had substance abuse issues all the time. Okay. Between th- that and the giant shirt and the way they did, they did a two-minute match stretched out over like 15 minutes. Maybe it's out of shape. I don't know. It would explain something. Boring chance for Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio Jr. And deserved. I don't blame these fans. Yeah, this was not like the opener. No. So six hours in, Chavo Guerrero runs out oh, with a hobby can- horse. Why? God, it's just like they write this show to infuriate me. The match is bad enough, and then they send out Chavo Guerrero in his goddamn stick horse. Get out of here. <laughs> so stupid. And then Ray fucks up a roll-up and has to... I mean, the roll-up's the finish, and he screws it up. Mm-hmm. So he does an Oklahoma roll. Like, a shoot Oklahoma roll. Yes. Like, he had to think on his feet, and he just did a shoot Oklahoma roll and pin the guy. That was the only good thing about this match. So the LWO runs out to attack Chavo. Great. <laughs> Dude, I would have bought an LWO shirt on the spot if I would have been watching this in 98 and had any money. <laughs> but Ray pulled him out and they left together. God. Didn't give him enough of a beating. So to recap, the LWO united as a group because they're all sick of wrestling each other and now they're feuding with other Mexicans still. Yeah, they're sick of wrestling each other. So... It makes sense. I guess. They want all the Mexicans on their side, so they have to wrestle somebody else. If you're a Mexican who who, who is not on their side, they don't want to wrestle you, so they're going to beat you up. <laughs> it's the only logical thing on the whole show. You had me last sentence. It's the only logical thing on the whole show. No, they want to beat him up so bad he never wrestles again. I see. They don't want to beat him up to set up a feud. Now the best thing on the show. Conan music video. This was awesome. Oh my gosh. Oh, get out of here, Craig. Oh, my gosh. This was so great. I don't know about that. Now, it was hokey. The production was wacky. I mean... This was great, you said? Yeah, it was fun. Okay. This was, in fact... Conan's rapping. People rapping and dancing and driving around the load riders and yep. working the hydraulics. And it was great to see people on the show just having fun God, for it was once. great. I had so much fun watching this. Yeah, it was fun to watch. To listen to? Not so much. Oh, Craig's get out of here, fan Craig. Of no, I don't mind rap. Maybe you'll do Pearl Jam next time. Then you'll like it. I know. I don't mind rap. I just think Conan is not a good rap. Oh, get out of here, you curmudgeon. Actually, now I want to hear Conan asking Pearl Jam. This was awesome. That's intriguing. 
It was great. What did he say he wanted to be a fridge? A bus. A bus. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Something, something, I am a bus, I believe he said. <laughs> something along those lines. <laughs> I See, loved it. It's not a good rap if you can't decipher it. Well, he did, it was, was freestyle, Craig. There was a lot of mumbling It was freestyle. He did the best he could. They recorded a freestyle. Yeah. Okay. I just loved it. Like, Conan's just chilling out in places. There's a funny line where, like, he's in a club. <laughs> he's in a club, and he's sitting in a, in a seat, like, way up on some bleachers or something, and the camera's nine miles away, and it's like the Rainmaker. Yes. It zooms right in on him, and he does a line. <laughs> like, who put this together? It's oh, man. Awesome. What do you think put it together? And this next segment is where I just lost my mind. This was the dumbest segment in the history of professional wrestling. That's fair. In case any of you thought there was too much wrestling on the show, and were hoping somebody would come out and bullshit for a while, I've got good news. Out comes Eric Bischoff and Miss Elizabeth. So Eric starts talking about Flair. He says, Flair is not going to wrestle tonight. He cannot pass the physical. He has no blood pressure. He has no heartbeat. That does sound serious. In Eric's defense, I wouldn't put him in the ring either. So then Eric says he's upset that J.J. Dillon had fined Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell. So he brought out some attorneys and a corporate controller. Because what I want from my pro wrestling show is politics, lawyers, and bureaucracy. I'm all fired up now. These three lumps of flesh get in the ring. They may as well just brought in three cadavers. They get through their lines. No humanity to them. No relatability. They, there's like un uncanny gap people. I'm not sure they were actual humans. <laughs> I was going to say, it was like he was beating up mannequins. Yeah. So <laughs> the mannequins would have sold better. So Eric, there's lawyers there, and one of the guys signed the checks or took the money away. Who gives a shit? Just talk about what happened. So Eric is mad at them, and he begins to kick their asses. He starts attacking attorneys. And a controller. What the hell they With the fucking lamest kicks you've ever seen the worst selling you've ever seen it's too bad one of them wasn't joseph park like you know when when yes when there's an is. assault backstage at a wrestling show involving the wrestlers and you're like shouldn't that guy like go to prison yeah i mean maybe and i know this because the wwe weirdos get mad at me when i say this but like you know they're wrestlers they want to get their own revenge. Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman, you know, Roman tries to kill the guy, but it's wrestling. They're wrestlers. You know, it's okay. These were fucking three attorneys and Eric Bischoff. This guy should be in prison for the rest of his life. Yes, because who is more litigious than a lawyer? <laughs> Just beats him up, leaves him laying, and then goes away. And these guys were so boring that when Eric beat them up, it got no reaction. No one cheered. No one booed. Nobody cared. Here I wrote, this fucking show fucking sucks, and I don't want to fucking watch it anymore. Then I realized, there's an hour to go. Dude. Well, it didn't help that B Bischoff threw the worst strikes, and these guys didn't sell good. You don't say. So Putting therefore, untrained performers in a wrestling ring and asking them to perform wrestling acts backfired? Huh. Right. That's why the crowd sat on their hands and didn't make any kind of noise whatsoever. Because it was phony. I rank and it this, was boring. I rank this worse than the Judy Bagwell segment. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Actually. Okay. Yeah. This was the stupidest segment. I'll tear that apart too, but this was worse. I actually think this was dumber than Warrior in the Mirror. I just, I, I hated this with every ounce of my being. It was so stupid. They recap Scott Steiner going crazy last week. And then Steiner attacking Rick, Pick, Rick Patrick on Thunder and nearly breaking his leg until Buff pulled him away. Excuse me. Rick Patrick? That was his name? Nick Patrick. Nick Patrick, oh excuse me. Oh my god. He's just losing his mind. At this point, the fireworks for the third hour began, and it suddenly occurred to me, <clears throat> Bill Goldberg's still the world heavyweight champion, right? Because we're two hours into Nitro yet, and no one said his name. Well, it's a funny story. Apparently, apparently there was, uh, what the hell was the name of that movie? Universal Soldier. Mm -hmm. It's actually a big story, because apparently Universal Soldier wanted Steve Austin to be in the movie... And Vince turned them down, mm. and Vince told Austin that they'd only offered him, like, $50,000 to do Universal Soldier, 
And then I guess Austin found out that Goldberg got the role afterwards and got two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh-huh. And Vin and Austin was upset. Yes. And so Vince like shifted the blame to somebody else in the company, and it was a big rigmarole. And Vince eventually apologized, but I think Goldberg was filming the movie, but allegedly like he got the role, but it was not supposed to interfere with his Nitro dates. And he was on this show. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on. Is my point. So Steiner and Bag will come out for a promo. The ref is out there, but he tells the announcer, no WCW officials will have anything to do with Scott Steiner matches from this point forward. It's unsafe. So Steiner cuts a promo about fucking a bunch of women. Buff says he and Scotty are rich enough to just buy their own referee. Steiner starts calling out Roddy Piper again, for Christ knows what reason. Demanded WCW send somebody out to fight him. Out comes Chris Adams. Geek of the Week, 1998. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is actually even a bigger geek than Kenny Chaos, because Adam saw what happened to Chaos last week. You'd think. He runs out there, and Buff and Scott just beat the fuck out of him. <laughs> beat him and beat him and beat him. Buff says, there's no ref, we can do what we want. They put him in the Steiner recliner. Finally, Rick Steiner runs out and chases them away. And Rick challenges them to a tag team title match, which had me very confused. Because Rick won the tag titles, but he won it in a tag match with Buff as his partner, but they took the titles off Buff, and so he gave it to Kenny Chaos. Mm-hmm. But now, Rick says, I'll find a partner. Right. So the tag team champions right now are Rick Steiner and whoever he can find on that particular day. It's well, like the free bird rule, except the, uh, <laughs> the applicant pool is the entire roster. He won them by himself, so I guess the story was he doesn't have a regular partner. And Kenny Chaos got beaten up, and so I guess the only person he could come up with was Judy Bagwell. Well, Brian, thank you for explaining that, because WCW did not. No. I did the best I could. I, 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 was, I, I, don't, I don't get it. An unbelievable Lex Luger video package aired. I hope we get more of these leading up to World War III. Michael Buffer, I'm certain, wrote this copy, and I wrote down the entire thing. To find the most well-conditioned athlete in wrestling, look no further than the total package Lex Luger. His body is chiseled out of granite, and his mind is that of a scholar. Never backing down from a challenge, Lex uses his intelligence, along with his experience, to exploit his opponent. Always on the attack, he looks at the weaknesses on the other man and takes advantage of his flaws. His tremendous endurance enables him to wear the man down until that fateful moment when he puts him in the awesome torture rack. This year, he's looking for another shot at the world title. And there's like Southern Rock in the background as he's just put, putting dudes in the rack and flexing all day. And it was so ridiculously cheesy, you would think this would be a heel promo. But no, it was supposed to get Lex cheered. I guess it didn't hurt him, but it was so wacky. Hey, at least you were trying to get somebody over. That's right. Unlike the rest of this fucking show. Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner versus Rick Steiner and a mystery partner. And yes, Judy Bagwell came out in her sweat into the oldies sweatsuit with a tag team championship belt around them. <laughs> and her goddamn earrings and in. The earrings. Okay, so listen. They bring out Judy Bagwell, okay? So let me repeat this. Steiner and Bagwell have challenged Rick to a match for the belts. Correct. Rick comes out with Judy. Judy Bagwell. Rick comes out with Judy Bagwell. Do we all got that? Okay. For some reason, this makes Scott and Buff furious. (laughs) They're furious that they need to challenge for the belts against Rick Steiner and Judy Bagwell. Why are they mad? So Judy gets in the ring. Rick goes after Scott. Buff Bagwell swings at his mother. Right. She yeah. ducks. She slaps him. He takes a bump and the heels bail. Correct. Buff then says, This ain't happening. Now, God damn it. <laughs> this is not happening. So, then, uh. <laughs> then, uh, do we got all that, by the way? Okay. That's what happened. Then the heels, after bailing out of the ring here, in their chance for a championship match against Rick and Judy Bagwell, 
They bell the they bell the ring, and then they say, "You know what? We want this match for the titles at the pay per view." What? What? Why don't you take the fucking match right now? So, Rick is daring them to get in the ring. Hey, Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell, why don't you get your ass in the ring with myself and Judy Bagwell? But they won't. They've got to do it later. You know, this was really stupid, but it was not as stupid as the lawyers. It wasn't. I can at least hear, I can rationalize that Buff Bagwell doesn't want his mother anywhere near a wrestling ring. Right. Sure. So there, there, there's like, there's there's straws here that can be grasped at. Yes. Not to mention, Buff wouldn't actually strike his mother, even though he tried. But he tried. Now, can you imagine Scott Steiner? This, yes, you can. This is the what really, this, this is the stupidest thing about this. Right. They've spent a month saying Scott Steiner is an out-of-control homicidal maniac. Yes. He's as crazy on this show as Kane is on Raw. He just doesn't have gasoline or fire fingers. But he'll kill anyone at any time, including apparently Roddy Piper and J.J. Dillon. So your plan, your dragon slayer to stop this monster, is to get a middle-aged woman with earrings. Middle-aged. That's very yeah. generous, fans. Yeah. Now, you can rationalize this in another way. It's not elderly. You can rationalize this in another way. Kind of. <laughs> Rick Steiner <laughs> knew that Buff was not going to really beat up his mom. Right. That's why he brought her out here. However, that doesn't explain why when they do the rematch of the pay-per-view he's going to bring judy out again then they'll have a plan <laughs> but see at least bagwell and steiner at least when they bail they sort of rationalize it by saying listen okay we gave you a chance we are not going to give you a chance next time although their heels why don't they just beat up judy or right? why do they want rick to get a tougher partner or why isn't the story that Steiner is more than happy to kill Judy Bagwell, but Buff is protecting his mother. I don't know. This thing sucks. It really sucks. But it was not as stupid as the lawyers. I no. stand by that. I concur. Conan versus Bret Hart. They didn't mention that it would be a special Tuesday edition of Nitro next week. And oh, hey, by the way, Goldberg, the world champion, will be on it. No graphic for this, no video package, no promo, just the announcers whispering it during Conan's ring entrance. They started brawling on the floor. I swear to God, I thought they were going to do a double count out in 10 seconds. There's no doubt in my mind it was going to happen. Instead of they're doing this match, it's okay. It's mostly boring. It's Brett working the leg. Crowd demands Sting, who was not on the show, but still got the biggest reaction of the night. And then Brett attacked Conan with a chair for the DQ. Stupid. What in the fuck? The only good thing about this is he destroys Conan's leg with the chair and... Conan is lying in a heap like the rock, laying on his side, yes, half dead, and the ref goes over and makes sure to raise his hand. <laughs> this man's the victor, everybody. <laughs> he needs his hand raised. I like Lex runs out to make the save and Brett flees. So Lex grabs three geeks and says, Let's get Conan to the back. And they don't like throw his arms over their shoulders and he walks out walks on one leg. The four guys get together. And they all reach over and grab each other's arms, and Conan just falls into their arms, make a human chair, and they carry him to the back like it's a cheerleading stunt or something. That made me laugh. As this is going on, Gene is getting in the ring for his next promo segment. He points at the floor here where Conan's been mutilated and just says, this happens very frequently. So Gene brings out Chris Jericho for a promo. There was a funnier line, but it's in this segment, actually. So Jericho came up with a pro, uh, with a hairdo that had the announcers all a tizzy in 1998. But let me tell you something. I've probably seen 20 different crazy haircuts on Enzo Amore alone. Yeah. Than on this. Mm-hmm. He just teases his hair up and uses a bunch of hairspray. He looked exactly like my daughter going down a slide. That's actually true. Yeah. I can imagine him saying, turn off the fan, man. <laughs> well, it's funny you brought up modern day Jericho, as we'll get to here. So Jericho cleans to be four up four and zero on Goldberg. He, hey, he mentioned it was his birthday today. Twenty eight years ago today, I was yeah. born right here in Long Island, which was true. That's true. It was his birthday. He said he knew Goldberg wasn't there tonight. Kept calling him Greenberg. So he knew Goldberg wasn't there because Ralphus had told him. Oh, 
Why not? <laughs> what a what a great source. They cut Ralphus. Back, they cut backstage where Goldberg had apparently just arrived at the building. He's carrying his bag and his belt. <laughs> this you know, let me explain what happened back here. <laughs> Goldberg is watching on backstage, and the best way to describe it is he was gotten to. Yes. Yeah. He just he could not take any more trolls. I don't think it was Jericho's I, the, the idea was Jericho didn't know he was there. So it was an accidental gotten to by Jer- on Jericho's part. Right. But yes, there was a monitor in Goldberg's room, and he saw Jericho making fun of him, calling him Greenberg, and saying he was 4-0, and, and Bo- Goldberg was totally gotten to. And he kicked in a door and started throwing couches around. Mm-hmm. And he goes to the... Uh, storms, storms to the backstage area and goes out on stage. And the camera, like, all you can see, it's almost behind him, and all you can see is the back of his head. And I was like, what's going on? And finally, they cut to another view... You can see Jericho was backing his way up the aisle, and everyone can tell it was going to happen, and it was awesome. It's, it's one of those where swerves are usually bad. Tease something, make people want it, and then deliver. Mm-hmm. Jericho's backing up towards Goldberg, and he's closer and closer. He turns around, and Bill Goldberg speared Chris Jericho back to Winnipeg. He <laughs> ran ahead of steam, and he just fucking destroyed this guy. He hit him so hard, the hairspray flew out of his hair, <laughs> and it was straight again by the time he hit the floor. You know what's great? They <laughs> the showed spear. replay after replay after replay in the slow best. motion. It was so awesome. And then Tony Schiavone, in the middle of this carnage, describes Goldberg by saying, yes. and, I, and I quote, yes. he wrestles very angrily. <laughs> He's not wrong. He's not wrong. This is so awesome. So the other highlight of this, besides the multiple angles and the slow motion, and he hit, he speared Jericho and they went up. <laughs> Just destroyed him. And Goldberg stomps to the back and Jericho's down on the ground grabbing his ribs, ribs, writhing in pain. At which point Bobby Heenan said, seriously, I'm not making this up. I think Chris Jericho just made the list. Yes, he said that. In man, the irony man. of all ironies. Chris Jericho's most successful gimmick was stolen from Bill Goldberg. <laughs> Amazing! Main event, Scott Hall and Giant versus Kevin Nash and Lex Luger. Hideously boring main event. You hey. know what? Giant's got one foot out the door with his company. He's going to leave. Mm-hmm. And yet he wasn't the laziest guy in the match. Nash was. Nash was very, All I very know, lazy. He didn't take one bump. Of course not. All I know is, this is better than last week's giant match. Barely. So... You know what made me the most angry about the match? It wasn't even the match itself. But in the middle of this boring main event, at the end of a three-hour show that absolutely sucked, they fucking announced that tomorrow night, there's a special one-hour edition of Nitro on Tuesday. I was like, like, what? In case you haven't had enough. An extra hour? Why? I guess sweeps. So, eventually Nash gets a hot tag. He does what he can do, the five things he's got. And then Brett runs in and attacks him for the disqualification. Fuck off. (laughs) So, Lex grabs a chair. He chases the NWO away and the show ends. The finish is on this show, Brian. Yes, tell me. Pinfall after outside interference. No finish because the Wolfpack wanted to cut a promo. Clean pin. Pin after a man was kicked into his own nephew. Intentional DQ by a guy who was winning. And DQ due to outside interference. And the most amazing thing, rather than how good or bad those finishes are, there's only six of them. Yeah, in three hours. It's a three-hour show. It's not like there was an Iron Man match in there. No. There were long stretches of non-wrestling bullshit in the show. This is a really bad show, and it only gets worse. It can't be true. It is. I know it is. But were it you watching be- it like every single week back then, or did you miss stuff or take time off? Do you remember? I definitely watched more than I missed. Oh, well, you're going to watch it all again. I, watched, I, I miss a. I, I remember because I did miss... The uh, Arn Anderson's retirement speech. I was very upset because I was like, the one Nitro I missed, and that's the one. So out of the 52 shows a year, I watched at least 45 or so. Dude. Well, you're going to be an expert within the next three years. And keep in mind, we only have to do this for three more years, Vinny, and then they're dead. <laughs> so that's it. At least there is an And today, everybody 
Today is the day. Today is the day, after all these years, that we're switching coverage. <laughs> we're going to do Nitro first? We're doing Nitro first from now on. Till the day this fucking show dies. <laughs> this piece of shit. And why would that be? Because it sucks. It absolutely sucks. The same thing in the newsletter, too. Like, when Nitro started, it was cool. It remained cool for a long time, and Ross sucked. And so the Nitro coverage was always... Nitro was always the superior show. It went on last. Yes. It's done. I hit my wall today. Also, Raw was awesome. But this was a week where Nitro was completely obliterated by Raw. Both in terms of quality and the ratings. They got just... They just got hammered in the ratings. Show sucked. Like, I believe in The Observer, Dave said it was a pretty good show. I don't know what show he was watching. This show sucked. Raw was a thousand times better. The tide has turned. Nitro's never winning again. So let's just let's just let it die. Over the next three years. It's painful. Three more fucking years of this? Are you kidding me? And it's getting worse. Now the one good news, the good news, the one piece of good news, is I have been alerted that it's only about another year left of three hour shows. Then it goes to two hours of shit. That's actually worse than those three years total. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a positive. It'll only be two hours long. I guess. This three-hour show is just such a drain on my life. I'm so depressed on Tuesdays. Five fucking hours. Not even five. Seven hours. Because I also have to watch SmackDown. Because I got to be able to talk about it for Observer Live on Wednesday. Uh -huh. So I watch seven hours of wrestling. And three hours of it every week is invariably horrible. And the other two, it's a crapshoot. Some weeks, like this week, Raw is good. Some weeks, SmackDown is terrible. Some weeks, it's okay. And it's the winter. So let's just get this over with before I kill myself. I feel like Hawk right now. Ready to climb up onto the Titan Tron. And leap. Jump. WCW Monday Nitro number 166. November 16th. Ironically, they're plugging World War Three this coming weekend. November 16th, 1998. How fitting. The Nitros of this era... They're all so completely indistinguishable that it took me like five minutes to figure out which show I was. I had, I had not seen which ones I had. I kept reading the descriptions. I thought, that sounds familiar. This sounds familiar. That also sounds familiar. All of these sound familiar. Then I started watching. I was like, no, I watched that one. I haven't seen this one yet. Okay, here we go. This is the right one. Hulk Hogan's presidential motorcade arrived. The show can die. I mean, it does. <laughs> but boy. It's it, fucking motorcade. Like, come on. Hulk Hogan's running for president. Who was watching this shit? I don't know. Besides people... I mean, if you were paid to watch this, then that's one thing. But, I mean, if you were watching this for free, I feel like you when you yell at all the Raw viewers. Like, what the fuck were you thinking watching this shit? He's coming out as the president. He ain't the president. I'm aware. He was the top heel. Now he's coming out trying to be a babyface. It's so stupid. Kibben versus Juventud Guerrera. At least something good on this show. A very good opening match. Like a pay-per-view quality match here in the opener. The announcers spent the entire time plugging in the Nitro debut of one Bobby Duncan Jr. Oh, he's a great athlete. Second generation star. Over and over and over again. For, for several minutes, ignoring this, this championship match here to plug Bobby Duncan Jr. Not only did they ignore this match, but the story of the show was they ignored this match. Not just this match. Like five matches here on this show. What's going on over there? You got the flu? I may have. Jesus. Coffee, but since I got here. They, 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 over and over again. Ignored matches. Yes. They even, they even explained to us, sorry, we haven't been paying attention. That happened once. At least once. More than once. Yeah. I just love the idea that Bobby Duncan Jr. is the guy who's going to turn this war around. The other channel has The Rock. He's a second generation guy. We'll get Bobby Duncan Jr. to be our The Rock. Well, hey, he wasn't. No. Had a very fun opening match. A brief Hoovy sucks chant, but he was not a heel, so they gave up. Went back and forth, tease finishers, and then Hoovy... They had kickouts. There were kickouts of finishers here. There were, there were near falls off finishes. Mania near falls, in fact, yes. That's right. The Hoovy taking the German but landing on his feet, hitting the Michinoku driver for a near fall was great. And Kim went up for the shooting star press, but Hoovy crotched him and threw him down. Hit the 450 splash to win the match in the Cruiserweight title. A very good opener. Finish was awesome. 
Probably could have shaved off a few minutes in the middle. It was another one of those Nitro matches that they just have gone forever. And listen, I don't want to say it wasn't great. It was great. It was still too long. That is possible. Then Kidman gave him the belt afterwards. That's right. Everybody cheered. They were totally into the match. I wasn't mad yet. I mean, I was mad because Hogan had shown up as the president or the limo was there with the Secret Service. But I mean, other than that, so far, so good. I hadn't decided yet, but Nitro was going to go first. That was still to come. Wrath versus Raven. Oh, by the way, they played the show open 20 minutes into the show. Yes. Because legally, you must play the show open. Seriously? Yeah. In television, you must play that open. I was not aware. Yeah. But I guess you can play like whenever the fuck you want. <laughs> Because they played it 20 minutes into the they show. played at the end, then. Hmm. I had, I had no idea about that. That's weird. It may be changed now, but in the 90s, mm-hmm. you had to play your open. So this was going to be a big step up in competition for Wrath. But Raven did a promo about his mother had been super controlling, just like Judy Bagwell. Now he was an adult. Nobody told him what to do, and he wasn't doing this match. So Kenya takes the mic and asks, what's wrong with you? I'm begging you to wrestle. And if you won't, quote, then I'm going to get my shtick in. So Raven leaves. Kenya does his promo. He got his shtick in. He did. Yeah, just like he promised. He mentioned he was scheduled to wrestle Glacier, and then Wrath jumped in from behind. Not technically a match. Wrath just hit him with a meltdown. Then Glacier came out after the break. Or no, Glacier came out. Wrath gave him the meltdown, too. They went to break. Then during the break, Wrath beat them both up for several minutes. And then it came back. They still did the stupid match. Oh, my God. This this was the beginning of me turning on this. It's supposed to be Canyon versus Glacier. Wrath beats up both guys. Great. Let's move on with our lives. Yeah. Instead, both guys are down in the ring. They show all the replays. They show Wrath killing both dudes. They show them both lying there dead. The ref just starts counting. One, two, three. I'm like, why bother? Just, like, get out of here. Fucking gets to nine. And Canyon crawls over and covers the guy. I was mildly annoyed. Because I was like, does it matter? Does Canyon have to pin Glacier? (laughs) Glacier fucking kicks out. He sure did. Oh my god, in heaven above. I was filled with fury. Then they just wrestled (laughs) forever. It fucking sucked. It would be one thing if it was good. It wasn't. It was not. They just kept going. The crowd is dead. They don't want to see this. I don't want to see this. Nobody wants to see this. Then Canyon just hits a flatliner and wins. As you've noted, Canyon was a really, really nice guy. Really talented and creative guy. He had no clue how to put together a wrestling match. In the middle of this thing, he takes Glacier outside and does a fame asser on the stairs. And he throws him in, and it's not even a close near fall. It's your average two count. Then they just keep doing stuff. This did, in fact, suck. Nitro party clips. Not sure who these dudes were there. Uh, not sure who these dudes were. But not only did they have girls at this party, but they got the talk the girls into doing pudding wrestling. I was shocked. Should have been on the Raw party. I mean, maybe Raw in a couple of years. A recap of Hulk Hogan running for president. Sonny Ono versus El Gringo. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny is like, the fake blue blazer comes out every week. I have no idea who it is. This fucking guy came out. I knew immediately it was Kaz Hayashi. Yes. It's not even like I see Kaz Hayashi all that much. He's barely ever on this show. And it wasn't like the mask exposed his face. No. But it exposed enough that I knew immediately it was Kaz Hayashi. Now, the bad news is they made Kaz Hayashi into the biggest geek I've ever seen in my life. They're way up there. Okay, if we, if we ignore that... I thought this was great. Sonny Ono gets in the ring. By the way, Mike Tanay has no clue. It's Kazuyashi. Gringo catches Sonny Ono's foot and shoves him, and Sonny Ono just took the greatest martial arts bump. He took a break fall. Mm. It's like a great bump. Then he explains, that's not what I paid for. Gringo unmasks. It's Kazuyashi. Apparently, I was the only person on the planet that recognized Kazuyashi. He took the mask off. Nobody knew who he was. Yeah. Dead silence in the building. He was not a big star. No. Shat runs in. He kills Hayashi with a kick. Sonny Ono gets in the ring, covers him, gets the win, and then Sonny Ono demands the Shat hold him back as he hides behind him. <laughs> Sonny Ono was so 
awesome in this segment. If you care about Sonny Ono, this was awesome. <laughs> You're the if guy. You, if you care about Kazayashi, this was geek of the week material back here in 1998. Bailey was laughing at El Gringo. <laughs> well, speaking of laughing, someone pulled a great rib on Dean Malenko. Dean, they said, you're going to team with Steve McMichael, and your opponents are going to be Horace and Stevie Ray. Yeah. I'm going to say this again. Dean Malenko and Steve McMichael versus Horace and Stevie Ray. So Dean started, and he did really what he could, and for the minute or two he was in there, it was uh, an average Nitro match. And then Mongo tagged in. The horror that followed... Of Mongo trying to work with Horace and Stevie Ray. Dude, <laughs> I was getting ready to flip my lid when I saw him in there with Stevie. But then he got in there with Horace and he was just as horrible. And Horace could work with Dean. Yes. So Horace wasn't like great, but he wasn't that bad. He was the second best guy in this match. Nobody can do anything with Mongo. No. He's hopeless. And he drags down those around him. The three-way brawl in the corner when Mongo was trying to fight his way out and they were trying to hold him down. Like, the very worst pro wrestling can be. And then Dean was like, tag me back in, you assholes. Tagged him back in, he did what he could. It was a fine plan in the short term, but then it led to Mongo making a hot tag. And my jaw was just open watching these oafs lumber around. How could all three of you be this bad? It's not all three. It's Mongo. If Mongo would have made a comeback on Dean, it would have been horrible. He's the worst. He's got to be the worst full-time wrestler who got a push I've ever seen. He's way up there. So, Arn punches out Vincent on the floor, and Stevie Ray lays out Mongo with the slapjack, as in the weapon, not the wrestling move. But Arn pulls out a tire iron and cleans house. For the DQ. We cannot have a finish in this match. No one, None of these men can be pinned. No. As I wrote here, an amazing, breathtaking pile of shit. You know what's even funnier about it? It's it, As bad as it was, it was also stupid. Because Doug Dillinger comes out, and he wants the tire iron. What about the fucking slapjack? I don't know. That's an illegal weapon. But he didn't give a shit about that. Yeah. That tire iron, That's that's got to go. In fact, they, they later arrest Arn Anderson because he used a tire iron. We were told Arn, Arn Anderson had been arrested, yes. Taken to prison. But man, that slapjack, that's eh, okay. Let it fly. Yeah. In the very next segment, Mean Gene brings Ric Flair out for a promo. Here, Flair said, yes, Arn Anderson is being taken to jail by Eric No Guts No Gonads Bischoff. He talked about wanting to chop Bischoff so hard, Bischoff would grow new nipples. Not sure how that works, but I laughed. And said, yes, I have blown a lot of money because I lived a great life, but I also saved some. And somehow this led to him bringing out Barry Windham. Well, the storyline is that Eric Bischoff, who like six months ago lost all control of WCW and was not allowed to hire or fire anybody in storyline, now he's just in charge again. And so he claimed, you can't bring back Barry. I didn't hire him. I fired him a few years ago. So Rick claimed, I'm using my money I see. to, ba to pay Barry Windham. I see. Why? Well... Watch his 30 for 30. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So, Flair says... Flair says Wyndham would tear up Bischoff's girlfriend and get started to get very specific about Barry was, what Barry was going to do to Elizabeth, mentioning her by name. Barry's caught totally off guard. <laughs> he he literally goes, prepared. whoa! <laughs> Hang on there. And the only way I can put this is they scurried to commercial. They cannot get to this commercial break fast enough. He told Liz... Get ready, because BW's in town. I thought he was going to take her downtown. Uh, one way or the other. Yeah. He's going to do both. I guess so. He's in town, he's going to take her downtown, and he's going to tear her up. Yeah. Uncomfortable visual. It was. Especially for Barry. Eddie Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. Are these guys, like, what's going on? This, this is, is two weeks in a row, they're unable to have a good match. This is better than last week, but not much. Man, they just... We're fucking up spots left and right. Like 20 seconds in, they're doing like arm ringers, and Ray runs up the ropes and does like a moonsault flip into a DDT. 
It was just like AJ's Moonsault into the reverse DDT, but Ray did it in one motion. It looked a thousand times cooler. And it wasn't even a near fall. <laughs> he just did this awesome move. The bigger issue is he ran up top and he jumped off and did a... Yes. That, like a whatever, fe- beginning the, of a Phoenix Splash. He did a Jeff Hardy dive. Eddie's nowhere to be found. No, he's miles away. And Ray falls down on the ground, and the ground moves, and Eddie just takes the bump anyway. This is Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. Yeah. Fucking up moves. Yeah. Having a bad match. Ray's 10 pounds heavier than last week. His voice is down a full octave. I don't know what's going on. So the story here, as explained in the promo, was Eddie says, we've wrestled twice. We had one draw, and you beat me with interference. But I still respect you, Eddie, or Ray. So here's the, here's the deal. If I beat you tonight, you will join the LWO. If you beat me, I'll get off your back. And Ray confirmed these terms. If I beat you, he'll leave me alone. And Eddie says, quote, we'll part as friends. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. I don't know why. We'll part as friends. Made me laugh. So they had a sloppy, sloppy, sloppy match. Eddie's mysterious unnamed bodyguard tripped Ray for the heat. Uh, let's see. Eddie power bombs Ray. Hoobie runs out to hit Eddie. Eddie dodges. Hoobie hits Ray. What an idiot. Eddie hits a frog splash. What were you even doing out here, you numbskull? I don't know. So Ray, against his will, is in the LWO now. So if you are a young listener and you've only seen videos and you don't believe it's possible for Ray and Eddie to half-ass a match, watch this week, watch last week. There's your evidence. Judy Bagwell did a pre-tape promo from the hospital. Dude. All of a sudden, the announcers just say, Judy Bagwell's in the hospital. What? They cut to her. She explains that Scott beat her up. Basically, what? Scott put me here in the hospital, she says, and Buff, you just stood and watched. I need to undergo surgery, she says. When's it going to end? I'm a mom on a mission. I want to get rid of Buff and bring Marcus back the way he used to be. What in the fuck is going on? Scott Steiner beat up Judy Bagwell? <laughs> I, I, yes. That is what we were led to believe. Now, what I was led to believe was Judy and Scott and Buff are in cahoots, and they're all going to screw Rick. We'd like to think so. I mean, right? That, that's a better story than Scott beat up a middle-aged woman. Believable, though, that may be. So the announcers had no idea what she was talking about, but they took her at her word. Puff Bagwell actually let Scott Steiner beat up his own mother. Which, by the way, Steiner must have had a bad day because, I mean, yes, she was in the hospital, but she looks fine. We don't know what he did. <laughs> maybe be, maybe tore her foot off. This must, I guess that's true. We didn't see anything from the waist down. That's true. She, she was mean, in a bed. She, she, her legs may be gone. I hadn't thought of that. Scott Putsky, because this show must have 87 guys named Scott, versus Chavo Guerrero Jr., I had my finger on the button because I have vowed I will never watch any of these stupid Chavo matches with that fucking horse. And thank God I didn't because this was an angle. They cut backstage. A Cadillac zooms in. They say, is this part of the motorcade? What is this? And out jumps Bam Bam Bigelow. I could not believe my eyes. <laughs> you forget this happened? I totally. I was like, what the fuck is Bam Bam Bigelow doing here? Bam Bam Bigelow has been in ECW for years. He was their champion. I think he lost it maybe even the night before. Because he lost the title to Shane Douglas in this month of November 1998. But he pulls up, and he jumps out, and he starts throwing security dudes around and tossing furniture, demanding to know where Goldberg is. Couldn't have been the previous... Well, I guess if it wasn't on pay-per-view. Because... WWE had a pay-per-view the night before. Ah. It was on pay-per-view. It was the November to remember that year, whenever that was. So maybe it was the week before. I don't know. i would probably not still champion at this point, I assume. Maybe I'm wrong. Regardless, he can't find Goldberg backstage, so he goes down to the ring to murder anyone he sees. Poor Putsky and Chavo get powerbombed and press slammed and demolished. And Bam Bam demands Goldberg. Instead, out come Bischoff and Dylan together. Well, first off, we have Tony saying that Bam Bam Bigelow is one of the most dangerous men in the history of professional wrestling. That's what he said. One of the most dangerous men in the history of pro wrestling, Bam Bam Bigelow? Well, one of, if you consider, you know, he's... I mean, One of thousands? Yeah, one, one of the top 95%. And then, Tanae 
as Bigelow is invading the building and going after the talent, says, we've never seen anything like this before. It's like, how about the NWO? Isn't it the exact same thing, just better? I stand corrected. Bam Bam dropped the title in October. There you go. No, it is right here. I'm sorry. No. Shane Douglas beat Bam Bam Bigelow in November to remember, November 30th, 1997. So Bam Bam was still ECW champion when this angle happened. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. He won in October, lost in November. There we go. And I have totally lost my notes. Where are you? So Bischoff and JJ go. storm down to the ring. JJ yes. says Bigelow's not employed. He wants security to get him out of there. Out comes Goldberg. Goldberg's ready to fight. He's got his own security with him. And they get in the ring for a mighty pull apart. Fans are chanting Goldberg's name. It's all chaotic. And the last thing we see before they go to break is Bischoff demanding Dylan talk to him in the back immediately. They go to go to the break and they come back. The violence has been settled down. And Dylan and Bischoff are chatting. And Bischoff gives Dylan a brow beating and he fires him. Yeah. And Dylan says, You can't fire me, I quit. Get they to- have no idea what they're doing. They have absolutely no idea what they're doing. If they have been feuding for two years. Three years by now, actually. Why didn't one of them fire the other by now? I have no idea. All of a sudden, you can just fire each other? I just watched this, and Bischoff's firing Dylan because Bam Bam Bigelow invaded. I'm like, did I skip a year? What in the world is happening right now? And then, allow me, Saturn versus Conan. This was the worst thing I have seen in I don't even know how long. They start wrestling. Out comes the LWO. Of course, we got to cut backstage. It's Bischoff interviewing Gene, or by vice versa. Barry's JJ, says JJ's out of here. Says he's going to talk to Goldberg. Bam Bam doesn't work here. Says there's 60 men this Sunday in Detroit. Bam Bam will not be one of them. Goldberg is a champion. It's not on him to make himself available to any geek who comes in off the street. Goldberg storms out, grabs Bischoff by the neck, demands the match with Bigelow, and so the match is apparently on for tonight. So we go back to this horrible match. It's going on forever. It's horrible. It's Saturn versus Conan. Styles clash. Nothing looks good. Finally, the LWO just runs in and attacks Saturn for the disqualification. I'm infuriated. Crowd's dead. Conan then goes to help Saturn to his feet, but Saturn punches Conan. Saturn then proceeds to single-handedly beat up the entire LWO all by himself. He just wrestled a whole match. He's at the man disadvantage. This is the group that Eddie Guerrero was in the charge of, and now has just added Rey Mysterio. Saturn beat up every single one of them. They're hitting him. He's not selling a damn thing. He's beating him up. Goes up the ramp. Conan says, hey, this isn't over, punk. Get back here, busta. Saturn, this busta, goes back down to the ring and fucking beats the shit out of Conan again. And then it's over. Did I miss anything here? No, you got it all. This was the stupidest <laughs> went segment down. Just, Since the lawyers last week. Just like I saw it. You said I saw it the same way. I got nothing to say about the match. I do want to talk about Goldberg. The the interview that happened during the match. When Goldberg comes out... I actually didn't realize exactly what happened here until I watched the replay again later. Goldberg comes out. He says he wants Bigelow. And he gives Bischoff like one chance to say yes. And Bischoff does not say yes right away. So Goldberg grabs him by the face and pushes him back into the wall... He makes his demand again. Eric is still protesting. Eric makes, or Bischoff makes, damn it, Goldberg makes his demand a third time, and this time he moves Eric's head up and down to nod yes, and then Goldberg says, thank you, and he storms back into his room. I just love the thank you. He's such a nice boy. So we have that. We have the JJ segment. We have the Conan versus Saturn debacle. They go back to the announcers. Tony has his head hung low. (laughs) And he says, JJ's been fired. He's just bringing up every bad thing that's happened on the show. His head is hung. And then he looks up and he says, Well, let's lift our spirits up here. And he pounds the desk and says, 
bring on the girls. <laughs> and out came the Nitro Girls. Okay. I howled at this. <laughs> I absolutely died laughing and went back. You must, you everyone listen to me. You must watch this. Tony punching the desk and then screaming, bring on the girls. After lamenting all of the shit that we've just seen with his head hung low. It was incredible. <laughs> this show is the worst show ever. Well, it's going to get worse. Everyone quit bitching about Raw. It's like, gonna... you can, okay? You can bitch about Raw. You can bitch about SmackDown. Stop comparing it to Nitro, okay? Please. And now it gets worse. Oh, my God. Buff Bag will Before discuss... that, <sighs> the video package for Hall and Nash. I'll, I'll be honest, I did not pay attention. I'll tell you I, what, the... it's important to pay attention. Okay. The whole thing is about their feud. Okay. Okay? They hate each other. Just fucking remember that. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash hate each other. And let's think about this. They're going to be wrestling at World War III. In six days. Right now, we know two matches. <laughs> Hall versus Nash. Yes. And the Battle Royal. Right. That's all we fucking know. Correct. Remember that. Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner come out with their own referee. Slick Johnson. With Slick Johnson. His debut. They claimed this ref was superior to WCW officials. Had him count three to prove it. This part was actually funny, if I'm being honest. So Scott cuts a promo about fucking a bunch of women. Then he says, it's true. Buff Bagwell gave me permission to punch out his mother. And then he and Buff hugged. And then out came a man in drag, who they claimed was Mrs. Steiner. At this point, Bobby Heenan was done with the show. <laughs> let me, let, here's he the way... He did let, not let, 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 give a shit from this point forward. The way the dynamic is supposed to work is that Heenan is the heel announcer who plays along with all the silly games the heels are playing. He refused to. He wouldn't say his line, and so Tony says, that's Scott Steiner's mom. And Heenan says, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's all... It's all it, this was beneath the dignity of Bobby the Brain Heenan. He would not lower himself to call this action. Oh, no. He lowered himself. This dude comes out in drag. <laughs> Rick comes down, begins to rip the clothes. Well, first, uh, first Scott says, Buff, you let me beat up your mom. Now you can beat up mine. And Buff beat up this guy and pinned him. Yes. Then Rick comes down. Rick comes out. He's tearing off Mrs. Steiner's clothes. It's a dude in drag. Bobby Heenan, deadpan, just goes, not bad. He asks for a dollar. I guess he's going to go stuff it in this dude's bra. Steiner just... Rick's going nuts on him, screaming, this is not my mother. This ain't my mother. Heenan says, it's your dad. I don't know what was happening here. <laughs> Fucking NWO comes out. They attack Rick. It's just shit. Yeah. I gave up. That's, that's all I felt happened. like Heenan. Like, give me something to drink. Let's start drinking for the Nitros. I can't do this sober anymore. Chris Jericho versus the debuting Bobby Duncan Jr. Between Bobby Duncan and Barry Windham, I believe WCW at this point had more Cowboys than tag teams. Duncan was dead a year later from a drug overdose. Yeah. They did a match. It was a Nitro match. Jericho idiot proofed it. Tried to make Duncan look good. And he then, did. He didn't look bad. And then he grabbed his TV title. You walked out for the count out. Well, that's fucking lame. It was lame, but you know what? I wasn't expecting nothing. And when it was over, I thought, man, Duncombe didn't look bad. You got, in fact, nothing. Yeah. You could have gotten less than nothing. On that note, Hulk Hogan came out. Here we go, everybody. Doing his presidential gimmick. He says, I have a new intern. I guess this was supposed to be a Monica Lewinsky look lookalike. Yes. I will be honest, I have no idea what Monica Lewinsky looks like anymore. Well, I mean, or, at or the time... She, or what she looked like then. I mean, it was... I'm sure if this was 1998... It was certainly not a dead ringer. Yeah. But, I mean, it was Monica Lewinsky. Okay. So she came out. She presented Hogan with a cigar. They had a passionate embrace. The announcers were absolutely, utterly terrified to say anything. And pretty much admitted as, as such. Tony just says, I'm not saying anything. I, I think Bobby said, I could, but I won't. Something along those lines. So then Bischoff comes out, and suddenly... <laughs> I did like when Bischoff came out, because he's had a bad night. 
and he clearly does not want anything to do with this bullshit in storyline. But it's Hulk Hogan. And so he comes out there looking like his dog died. But every time Hogan throws to him, he has to act all happy for the Hulkster. I did love that. That's all well and good. Hogan suddenly vows to be NW champ or well NWO champion again someday. So he's gonna be president and world champion. Well, the election's not till two thousand. I see. He's got time. That's valid. Suddenly Scott Hall's in the ring. And suddenly Scott Hall, I guess, is questioning Bischoff's loyalty to the NWO. Well, he's asking him where his head is at. What does that mean? I don't know. He did look sad. I had absolutely no idea what was happening. This started off as a wacky political political joke, and now it seems like it's one giant inside joke that I don't understand one bit. Eric says, we'll talk later, go to the back, and then Scott Hall punches him out, and Hogan attacks Hall. What the hell is going on? Hey, it gets better. (laughs) Hogan attacks Hall, and stop, everybody. Who do you think makes the save for Scott Hall? Old buddy Kev. I gave it away, as did you, but the answer is Kevin Nash. Let me repeat this. There are two fucking matches announced for the show on Sunday. A 60-man battle royal and one more. Hall versus Nash. Nash comes down and saves Hall. What in the fuck? Well. Do you know it only gets worse? (laughs) Nash saves Hall. They have a stare down. Nash says, I'll see you in Detroit. And he leaves. This is the worst show there's ever been. This is the new worst show they've ever done, by the way. Remember that one like a couple months ago that I said was the new worst one? You didn't think it was that bad? Yeah. This, can we agree? The new worst one ever? It was a goddamn horrible show. And then we had a great match. We had a great wrestling match. Bret Hart versus Chris Benoit. I wrote at one point here, why can't... Why, don't, why are there no longer any wrestlers this good? And then I realized there are, in fact, lots and lots and lots of wrestlers this good. They just don't ever get to go out and have good matches. They have to fight through shitty commentary and shitty camera work and shitty booking and shitty angles. They just went out there and wrestled. And it was fucking awesome. There aren't and a lot of people this good, Vinny. Well, there's a lot of people good. Yeah. These guys were great. These guys were fucking good. <laughs> but they just went out there and wrestled. I didn't have to deal with a shaky camera. I didn't have to deal with... 200 people talking over each other. I didn't have to be able to eight, deal with 8,000 catchphrases. They just put it on the hard cam, left it a nice, wide shot, steady. I could, I didn't have to struggle to focus on what was going on. Watch two dudes beat the hell out of each other. Let us separate Benoit from the killer for a second so I can make this comment. Do you know what I loved about him as a professional wrestler? Yes. Well, Bre- lots, but... Bret Hart was having a pretty shitty time, and he clearly didn't care. And he was doing a lot of half-assing. Benoit just pulled a great... And I'm not saying that, like, Brett couldn't have a great match. But, like, the moment this bell sounded, Chris Benoit went to work on this guy, and Brett just had to turn it on. Yeah. Because otherwise, no he was going to drown. Yes. And they had a great match. And even the finish, even the finish, where Brett... uh. Ben basically Brett gets a chair Benoit gets a chair from him he's gonna hit him Mickey J takes a chair Brett low blows Benoit and then destroys Benoit's arm with the chair for the DQ that has been playing into Brett's character of late yes so in a vacuum it was a great finish and a great angle in context it was a great finish now you know comparing everything else in the show where there was just one shit finish after another Mm -hmm. it made me mad sure but like if this hadn't been on such a horrible show this would have been totally fine so Malenka runs out to make the save. He chases Brett away, but then he turns his back, and Brett returns and beats his ass too. These guys are great wrestlers, but they are shitty horsemen. These well, horsemen suck. Yeah. So, and by the way, Brett is such a great heel that the first few minutes of this match, after three hours of shit, like the crowd was kind of into it, but they weren't that into it. Like they would like scream when Benoit chopped him and that sort of thing, but. They didn't care about anything on the show. Brett was so good that by the end of this, they were on fire. And then DDP comes out and clears the ring and challenges Brett to a match on Sunday. Finally, we have three matches. 
place went nuts for DDP. This was the best thing on the show. Oh, yeah. By like... <laughs> Tell me more. I'd say it was the best thing on the show in months. It was awfully great. Perhaps since Goldberg won the title. Yeah. So DDP runs out to chase Brett away. And then DDP cuts a promo. He says, Brett, the hit scum heart, is just like Hollywood scum Hogan and Randy, Randy Macho Scum Savage. He actually said this. He's got a theme. He's sticking with it. He dared Brett to come get his U.S. title belt, which is still in the ring, and Brett refused. And so he challenged Brett to a match at World War III. So I guess now we have three matches. Yeah, that's what you said. Yeah. And then Goldberg was going to wrestle Bam Bam Bigelow in the main event. But as Goldberg was standing in his pyro, Bigelow jumped him. Because Bigelow's whole gimmick is on fire. He's not afraid of pyro. And they brawled over by the side of the stage. Goldberg was still wearing his title belt as they were fighting. And security showed, swarmed to separate them. And at least the show ended on a high note. The last 20 minutes of the show were good. And now Raw. Well, very quickly. The I mean, they were good, but I mean, 90 seconds for the main event. Yeah. That sucked. So the finishers on this show were clean pin for a title change. Sort of clean pin after both men were killed by an angry giant. Pin after Cat kicked a Japanese guy pretending to be a Mexican, pretending to be an Anglo in the face. A DQ when Arn used an iron. Pin after a third party tried to interfere but hit the wrong guy. Double DQ due to attack by, by a guy with head tattoos. DQ due to attack by a Mexican gang. Count out because the guy just didn't want to wrestle anymore. And DQ due to intentional chair attack. Man. That's pretty terrible. It's terrible. Retro Raw 286. Great show. November 16th, 1998. Best Raw in months. The day after Survivor Series, Deadly Game. They showed one clip before the credits rolled. You know, it's funny, I watched well, it here tonight, and uh, last week I made the executive decision to switch what we were going to watch, when and where, or how we were going to recap them here, and I concluded that Nitro was so bad, and the Raw main event was so good, and Nitro was never going to get any better, that we should start doing Nitro first and Raw second, right? I, re I remember this, yeah. Okay, that's what happened. Well, I was watching the two shows this week, and... I mean, Raw had a good main event, but it's still, like, a really bad show. And Nitro, like, there was some stuff on it that was horrible, but, I mean, in general, like, it wasn't a bad show. And so I kind of had second thoughts about making that command decision. Like, maybe I jumped the gun. Maybe I did a little bit too early. Like, there's a lot of bad stuff coming, but, I mean, it was okay tonight, right? I thought it was fine, um... Maybe it's because I watched it first. I've been watching Nitro second forever. But it seemed to be, you know, it's still a three-hour show, but it went by much quicker than usual. Hmm. And it's, it was also a very simple show, so that may have been part of it too. But it, it was much less of a chore to get to than it's been in a long time for whatever reason. And then Raw was just bizarre. I, I've, seen, I've seen worse shows. I've certainly seen better shows. But it was just a strange show from start to finish. Well, you know, rules are made to be broken, right? Nitro number 167, November 23rd, 1998. He recapped World War III, where Kevin Nash won a battle royal in the title shot against Goldberg at Starcade. He said, Hulk Hogan will be making an announcement on The Tonight Show on Thursday. Because Hogan and Leno feuded all summer, but now apparently they're pals. Well, here's what happened. This was the show where Kevin Nash took over as the booker of Nitro. I know you're you're shocked to hear that, having seen this show. Kevin Nash has taken over as the booker. Hulk Hogan has claimed... I mean, this is what WCW is telling everybody. Hogan's really mad that Nash is now the booker and that Eric gave the book to Nash. And so he has left the company, and at the on The Tonight Show, he's going to announce his retirement. That's the story that that's they told... That's where going. Yes, that's the story they told all the wrestlers. Of course, yeah. only the stupid wrestlers believed it. Like, everybody else knew that it was it was a bullshit story. I mean, they're talking about Hulk Hogan running for president on this show. I mean, seriously. And, of course, you all know where this ends. It's all bullshit. And Hogan comes back. They do the finger touch of doom, January 4th, 1999. Ship sinks. Company dies. Whole nine yards. But this was the beginning. So that's why, that's why they said what they said about Hogan at the beginning. Well, now you've spoiled it. I, I, you may as well not review these shows anymore. 
Well, you know, it's funny you mention that because as this show goes on, like, I know where it's going, and I'm hoping that as we keep watching it, it won't happen. Like, maybe I was living in an alternate universe, but in the actual universe, like, they don't have Kevin Nash beat Goldberg, and somehow the company survives, and, and Vince has competition to this day. It's not going to happen, but I, I'm, I'm holding oh. out hope in the back of my mind. So they also also showed uh, Bam Bam Bigelow trying to crash the World War III Battle Royal, and Goldberg came out to fight him. The opening match, Lex Luger and Mike Enos. And before we get into the match itself, the announcers are talking about what happened at World War III. And they said Juventud Guerrera had joined the LWO and immediately, immediately lost the Cruiserweight title because Rey Mysterio Jr. had interfered, and then he had quit the LWO. Six days after he had joined. And I'm trying to wrap my head around all this. And the announcers say, it really is very confusing. <laughs> There's a lot of that on the show. Yes. So I'm not sure why Lex Luger and Mike Enos had to go 50-50 here in his nitro opener. I mean, it was, a, it was a perfectly fine match. And Lex was taking all kinds of bumps and he's doing like the top rope clothesline and a superplex. Superplex, excuse me. All these moves he, that never does. He's doing it for Mike Ennis. And eventually he hit the power slam and the torture rack for the usual massive pop in the wind. I mean, it was good. I just don't know why it had to be, why it had to happen. Well, Luger was over, as always. Mike Cheney used the term Orient, as always. That's where Mike Ennis had been, he said. Tour of the Orient. And, yeah, it was a good match, and the crowd was hot. It was the opener. It had Luger in it, and they had a competitive match. The place went crazy. It was good. Off to a good start. Praise be to Kevin Nash. <laughs> Goldberg's limo arrived at the same time at the Wolfpack's limo. The Wolfpack said that Nash is next, and they laughed. Goldberg warned them being next is not a safe place to be, and he added, ask your girlfriend. Why? Nah. It's just he's just trying to be funny, but man, Nash is out there. He's all happy. He's all cocky. He's just. It was. He was so infuriating by the time the show was over. Like I, I could barely contain my anger. But man, here's a guy who knows he's about to beat Goldberg in the streak, and he he didn't even pretend like he wasn't just giddy about it. You know, I did not realize until you told me just a few minutes ago that this was. The, the Nash's first show was Booker, but it explains a lot. <laughs> I'll just say it explains a lot. Sure does. Yeah. Mean Gene interviewed a Kidman who said he had... Now, keep in mind, it had been 24 hours since he regained his Cruiserweight title. He said to Gene, you know, my social activity has picked up tremendously. Now, if you're a youngster in 2017, you may think social activity means Instagram or Snapchat. Yeah, wasn't That's talking not what about his, to. not talking about his Twitter here. No, no. So he calls out Ray. See, the way it worked for all of you, all you youngsters out there, the way it worked was nowadays Kidman would win the title and he'd get a bunch of followers on Twitter. But in 1998, he won the cruiserweight title and he ended up with Tori Wilson. So you kids today are yeah. doing things wrong. <laughs> that is a solid point. So he calls out Ray. And he says, Ray, it was great to see the old Ray Mysterio Jr., not the guy in the LWO. Six days. Ray was in the LWO for six <laughs> Well, days. no. That the, the story was that Ray refused to join the LWO, but Eddie is holding it to him. So they haven't killed it yet. Ray was just trying to not... He Literally, Ray was trying to... Go back on his own word. And Eddie's not letting Yeah. But Kevin was still talking about the old Rey Mysterio like he'd been in the been a heel for six months. Well, there is that, yeah. Yeah. So he offered Ray a title shot. Ray accepted. Kidman left. But then Eddie comes out with his mysterious unnamed bodyguard. We still don't know who he is. Dude, it's been a so month, Ray. and they haven't even given that guy a name yet. Is it that hard? Oh, apparently so Eddie says, Ray, you signed a contract to join the LWO. 
I still want you in the group. I brought you a new shirt. And here's Ray, the 6XL t-shirt. It hangs down below his knees. He looks like the biggest goof in the world. And Ray left with him. Yeah, and he said that this shirt right here matches the expectations we have for you. I thought it was a funny line. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie was so over the top playing to the camera and just being a ham. He's another guy who no right. longer gives a shit. That's, yes, there's many of them on this show. Norman Smiley versus Chris Benoit. A reminder that Chris Benoit was unbelievably good at his job. It was a great personality clash because Norman was this silly guy who every time he got the advantage just wanted to dance and Ben Wall was the most intense guy in the world and he was not having it. And a great match for like three minutes and Ben Wall won with a crossface. This was the first time that Norman was really like hamming it up out there with his, his dancing gimmick and that sort of thing. And just kind of like... <laughs> so you watched Alex, Alex uh, Wright and figured, like, this is the way to get over. Is that what happened here? <laughs> of all of the guys to emulate, you chose Alex Wright? He's just being Norman. I guess. That's, that's what he's like. That's the best option I have. We had a clips of geeks at a Nitro party. Showed at the pay-per-view. For no apparent reason, the NWO turned on Scott Hall and kicked him out. And Nash ran out to make the save but then they're still not friends. And then Nash won the Battle Royal. He dumped Hall and Luger at the same time to win, so he screwed two of his friends to win. That's right. Like a dick. And, of course, they come out next, and Lex Luger, who got eliminated by Kevin Nash last night, is still his best friend. He introduces Kevin Nash, who is having the time of his life out there. He's dancing. He's smiling. To be honest, all three of them were. Sure. Luger says, here is your next WCW World Heavyweight Champion. And then, of course, Nash does his big promo. Whether you like it or not, I'm next. I'm going to be the one behind Goldberg's 190. He's going on and on about how he's going to win the title. He's going to beat Goldberg. He's going to end the streak. And, of course, they cut to Larry. And Larry goes, you know, you got to believe in yourself. And Nash, he's got the right idea here. I thought, just leave it to Larry. He's always got to be right. Even when he should be wrong, he's got to be right. So the Wolfpack goes backstage. Gene's there to interview him. He says, you guys never miss Scott Hall, Scott Hall out there. And Ash says he wants Hall as a friend again, but Hall has to prove he wants to be friends too. Goldberg passes by in the background. Nash makes a joke about how he needs his buddies to watch his back. And Goldberg stops and says, I'm, I'm going to attack you. What do you say? Uh, he I'm says, face to face. I want you to see the truck coming. That's right. And what does Nash do when Goldberg makes his threat? He stands there and he mocks Goldberg and he feigns that he's scared and he wiggles his fingers at the guy. I was just so done with him at this point. Just so done with him. This is, well, this I is have some bad news. Goldberg that you're mocking. This is the champion. This is the unbeatable Goldberg. And you're acting like you're not worried one bit about this guy, and he's not a threat, and he's a joke. It was so stupid. And then, as Gene is frantically trying to throw it to commercial, Nash has to get in the line about how Goldberg has too much caffeine. Yeah, that was a good one. That really made me want to see the match. Tokyo Magnum versus Canyon. So Magnum comes out, and Canyon's music plays, but there's no Canyon. The camera goes backstage where there's, like, complete darkness. But allegedly, Raven and Canyon are having an argument. They left nothing. Canyon came out for the match anyway. It went two minutes. Literally, the first move Canyon did was a middle rope Russian leg sweep. And he won two minutes later with a flatliner. Well, you know, we got some new moves in. Got to give him that. <laughs> I he guess did get some new moves. The good news was it was short. He didn't do 10 minutes of new moves. He did like three minutes with a couple of new moves and then one. Bobby Duncan Jr. versus Glacier. Now, there was a miracle here. You mentioned earlier that Mike Tanay 
said that uh, whoever it was was in the opener, they had been spending time in the Orient. A Mike Enos had just returned from a tour of the Orient. Well, here, Mike Tanay said, and I went back and checked, Bobby Duncan Jr. has been wrestling in Japan. <laughs> wow. I literally didn't think he knew that what the country was called. <laughs> well, that's amazing. How about this that? may be the only time he ever said the words word at Japan on Nitro. So the Bobby Duncan Jr. showcase. It was fine. It was eighty percent of it. I don't know. Did you not like it? Well, I thought I thought he looked horrible. So uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. But oh, the, then. the amazing thing was like. He had that match with Jericho, and I thought he looked really good. And then he comes out here for a match with Glacier, and he looked horrible. So here are the options. Option one, Jericho is very, very good, and Bobby Duncan Jr. sucks. Option number two, Bobby Duncan Jr. is fine, but Glacier sucks. I'm going with Jericho is really good, and Bobby Duncan Jr. sucks. Because of Bobby Duncan, also, what's the other option? There's a middle. There's a middle ground there. It can be a little bit of both. So Bobby Duncan Jr. is okay, and he was carried by Jericho, but because he was in with Glacier, Glacier couldn't carry him, and so he was worse. Basically, yeah. Okay, that might. We'll we'll find out because he ain't leaving anytime soon. Okay. What I'm saying is, it's possible Jericho was good, and Glacier sucks, and Duncan is. Neither as good as he looked last week, nor as bad as he looked this week. Well, I think that's that's probably you're probably right then. Now, what was weird here is that Duncan's got a bull rope because he's a cowboy, and he's going to use this bull rope, and the ref keeps stopping him. And finally, Duncan wins with a skull crushing finale. And then he grabs his rope. And I'm thinking, okay, he's finally going to get to do whatever he want to do with this thing. Then he left. Don't ask me, dude. But he used that rope later. That was weird. Gene interviewed the Giant. He is so fat right now. Like, I can't even get over it. Like, he's negotiating, or I guess, you know, they would claim he was not negotiating, but I mean, by this point, everybody knew pretty much he was going to WWF. I mean, how could you be so fat knowing you're about to go to WWF? Why aren't you getting into shape? Why aren't you dropping some weight? Why aren't you trying to get a little bit shredded so when you walk in there, you're like a monster? He's just a big, fat guy right now. He was pissed that Nash had coordinated a group effort to throw him out of the Battle Royal. Said Nash was a coward who was afraid to face him. So he was challenging Goldberg to a match. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's let's not jump over the fact that he said that the entire Wolf Pack had a bad case of chickenitis. That was, that, that's true. <laughs> that's that what he, he said. said. This wasn't yeah. Bret Hart. This was the Giant. Well, you're right, but again, there's a lot of guys on this show who didn't give a fuck anymore. So he said he could beat Goldberg tonight, and then he would win the world title, which would just be a stepping stone, because then Nash wouldn't be able to run from him anymore, and he'd get to face Nash at Starcade. So let's think so about this here. Well, let's think about yeah. this. So the entire point of the World War Three pay-per-view was to determine a number one contender. And then the giant, who got eliminated, just walks onto Nitro the next day and c- demands a title shot and gets it? Yes. Okay, that's number that's one. exactly right. Number two, in this storyline, which, I mean, if you really want to know who's writing this show, I mean, this stupid storyline. In storyline, to the giant, getting Kevin Nash is more important than getting the world title. Exactly. <laughs> this is mind-blowing. The world title is merely a stepping stone to a match of Big Sexy. Oh, it's killing me. Like, it, like, there's some things about this show that are better with Nash booking. Like, he actually put together some matches that were, you know, good, decent matches. He gave them time. He let them do their thing. But then there's stuff like this, which is just infuriating. We had Silver King versus Saturn. Saturn coming a pre-match promo, daring Ernest Miller to face him face-to-face. So they're doing this match. Cat comes out on stage, 
makes fun of Saturn for getting beat up by Sonny Ono. They misquoted Shaft. And then the match continued, and Saturn won won with a DVD and ran backstage to get the cap. Yeah, so what they did here was they had somebody come out in the middle of the match and cut a promo. Saturn listened to his promo. He did not get distracted and pinned. He listened to the promo, he turned around, he continued beating his opponent, and then he pinned him. That's right. I was so happy. Like, (laughs) I was writing about a distraction finish before it happened, and then it didn't. It is amazing. They showed clips from the Battle Royal confirming what Giant had said. Nash had recruited four or five other dudes, and they all threw Giant out together. Rey Mysterio Jr. versus Kidman. Remember that match they had about uh, three or four weeks ago that was just, it was like the 20-minute draw or whatever, even though it wasn't 20 minutes, and it just went on and on. It was so boring. Do you remember this? I do. This match was great. Now, normally, I'm a guy that likes psychology and wrestling. I don't just like all-action high... Oh, I mean, there there are some all-action high-spot matches that are good, but as a general rule, a good match with good psychology, nine times out of ten, I enjoy more than just a random match with a bunch of high spots and not a lot of psychology. When it comes to Ray and Kidman, this this match was not bereft of psychology, but it was totally unlike their first match. The first match was all about working over a body part, slow, methodical. This one was just one move after another. This one was a thousand times better. Because when you're Ray and Kidman, it's better to just do a bunch of high spots than to do a psychology match. You were right on many levels. What occurred to me was, this was basically a typical 2017 Ring of Honor match done on Nitro in 1998. It was two small men just taking turns doing cool moves. But the biggest difference is they weren't going too fast. So they would do a cool move, and then they would stop while everyone cheered. And they would do another cool move, and they would stop while everyone cheered. So they did half as much as a typical ROH match. I got twice the reaction. Good so for them. Eddie and Ho- yeah, great. Eddie and Hooventude run out. Kidman goes after Eddie. Hoovy, while wearing his eyeglasses, hits a Hoovy driver on Ray. And Kidman returns. His Sabine Star Press gets the pin. Ray did this move in this match which Mike today said he'd never seen before, which is saying something, by the way. He watched a lot of Lucha. Ray jumps over him like he's going to do the sunset flip. Kidman stops him in mid-move. Ray kind of goes up like he's going to do a code red. But instead of doing the code red, he keeps going up and turns it into a bulldog. This was so awesome. Why is nobody doing this today? Maybe somebody is, and I don't know who it is, or I don't watch enough Lucha, but man, this move was awesome. It was awfully cool. Ray also did a top rope superplex in this match, which I don't remember him doing before or since. It's true. Gene interviewed Bischoff, who said Ric Flair deserves some face-to-face answers, but he was going to make it clear that he was the boss, and he called out Ric Flair. Flair comes out in dockers and a plaid button-up shirt. Casual Ric Flair should not be a thing. It didn't he work. Needs to be in, he needs to be in a five thousand dollars suit, or in his gear and his robe, or at least at, like athletic gear. Flair just being a guy, he was just a guy. Flair being Daniel and Bryan is, never, is bizarre. Yeah, exactly what it was. Actually, he was dressed exactly like Daniel Bryan, which you don't want Ric Flair to be. Daniel Bryan should be Daniel Bryan. Ric Flair should not be Daniel Bryan. And Daniel Bryan should not so, be Ric Flair. <laughs> that would be even worse. That would be even worse. So, they're having a talk. And it's clear they don't like each other, but it's time to sit down and and, and, and get some things off each other's chest and try to come to some kind of understanding so they can work together. Somewhere in here, Bischoff drops a line about how Flair tried to hire Barry Windham, but Flair can't hire anyone. Only Eric can hire people because he's got the power. He calls Barry Windham out there. Okay, when now, comes on down. Let, me, let me jump in here very quickly. So remember last week when he fired J.J. Dillon? And I was like, why? What was the point of this? Why? Like, what's going on right here? So as soon as Barry comes out, 
Eric says, I am going to predict the future. Barry Windham, one of the original Four Horsemen, is going to look you in the eye tonight, Flair, and he's going to knock you flat on your ass. And it suddenly occurred to me, the reason he fired J.J. is because he wants to be Mr. McMahon. He wants to be the guy with all the power, so there cannot be another authority figure. Like, Vince doesn't have another authority figure. There's not somebody else that Vince has to answer to or has to feud with. Like, Vince is the man in charge. So Eric wants to be the man in charge. So they did the firing of J.J. Dillon, and here he is out here doing Mr. McMahon's guarantee. He's predicting the future, and he's telling you what's going to happen, and goddamn it does. I was just like, can you try something new? Like, you, there's no way you can be Vince McMahon. Like, it's impossible. So maybe let's do something else here, but nope. He's Vince. So they go back and forth a bit, and he slaps Flair, and Flair attacks him. And, of course, Wyndham attacks Flair from behind, and they get into a brawl. And Barry hits a low blow, and he holds him so Bischoff can hit some kicks. And the horsemen run out to make the save, but the NWO B team intercepts him in the aisle, and they brawl there. And uh, eventually, Wyndham left with Bischoff and the other NWO dudes, and that was that. It made sense. You know what? It was a hell of an angle. Uh, when when Flair went after Bischoff, the place just went nuts. When Wyndham went after Flair, and then Flair made his comeback, the place went nuts. They, of course, beat him down. Eric threw the worst kicks you've ever seen. Horsemen run out, and man, the even the B team looked like winners because they just fly in, and they take him out from behind, and they lay him out and put a big beat down on everybody, and... I mean, the Barry Wyndham turn was kind of preposterous. Like, that didn't really make any sense, but I guess we can argue that Flair was going to give him money well, and Bischoff outbid him or whatever, but I thought it was a great angle. I mean, Flair could give Barry money, but he can't, like, make him part of the company. Eric can give him a job. Oh, well, that's true. So he's, Flair could so pay him a one-time Eric. fee, but Eric could sign him to a long-term deal. Of course, of course. And, and and as we all know, he likes giving out long-term deals to just anyone who asks. So no, this all made sense, and and now it leads to because you couldn't and you couldn't do a series of matches with Flair and Bischoff. I'm pretty sure they do that at some point, but now you can do Flair versus Bischoff's uh, what's the word, his substitute, which is Wyndham. So that works. That all makes sense. We had picks of Conan versus Stevie Ray from World War Three. Booker T came out and tried to make peace. Steve Ray walked out, and I don't know if this was a match or somebody won or somebody else lost. All I know is these three guys had a confrontation. I cannot even imagine Stevie Ray versus Conan. Well, maybe sometime you can go watch it. It's on the no. network. No. Come on, you're on vacation. you got nothing better to do. I have so many things better to do than watch Stevie Ray versus Conan from 1998. Well, we did get Conan versus Booker T here on Nitro. This was not one of those things. <laughs> you were doing this match, and Stevie Ray just comes out and hits Conan for the DQ. <laughs> it was so infuriating. Like, I mean, there wasn't anything to the match. Oh, it gets worse. There was nothing to the match, but, I mean, the guy just walks down, he walks up the stairs, he stands on the apron, and he thumps the guy in the back of the head with a stupid slapjack, and it's a DQ. It's like, yeah. God, this show is killing me. You know what this feud is? This is the Briscoes just being done with Booker T and Stevie Ray, and they're doing a terrible version of it. I, I, I suppose that's technically true, but yes, I agree it's terrible. That we can agree on. And Stevie says, Dean, I beat this sucker in three minutes, and you couldn't do it in ten minutes. And I'm like, dude, the match was a minute long when you ran in. How do we know? <laughs> his, his argument was not sound. I mean, I'm glad you didn't make me wait ten minutes, but still. So Gene brings Brett Hart out for a promo. <laughs> okay, now before Brett comes out, Gene says, <laughs> The show's getting hotter by the week. It's being watched all over the world. In fact, we got a call from France last week. I was like, what? Can you give me a little <laughs> more information? What the fuck are you talking about? We got a call from France? Brett comes out for a promo. 
<laughs> and Brett is so done. <laughs> like, was this not an amazing he, promo for a guy being done though? No, no, no. That, that's why it was. That's why it was amazing. This is this amazing promo by a guy. I mean, he may have been actively trying to sabotage this, but that made it even better. He says, "Dad, a cheap win last night. He's still a punk. All these people are punks." He says he wants a rematch with Paige because, and this is a quote, that was the pit last night. <laughs> it wasn't even that, but the way, he didn't just say he wanted a rematch. He goes, I want some kind of rematch because that was the right. pit last night. Like, you know, it could be like a pie eating contest or pretty much anything. It's the pit. So he promised to make an example of somebody tonight said, Dean Malenko's got a bad leg, and he smiled. He was giddy that this guy had a bad leg. <laughs> yes. He says he's going to keep taking men out until Paige had the guts to face him again. Yeah, and he goes, Dean Malenko's like, got a bad leg, and I'm going to take his leg off, and I'm going to throw it in the crowd tonight. I'm like, man, that'd be cool. <laughs> it would be cool. This was like a minute long and was the best thing on the whole show. It was so great. He, he he said the people were punks with such disdain. You had Wrath versus Kevin Nash. Yep. Well, now you know, we'll this. this was the match. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we've known it was coming for a while now, and here it was. So we'll talk about... I'm sure you'll have a lot to say about what happened and why, but... I was expecting this match to actually just be terrible. And you know what? When they were running, especially Nash, they were the two biggest, clumsiest galoots you ever saw. Otherwise, this was really a really good wrestling match. Rath is flying all over the place with kicks, and Nash is bumping his ass off, going over the ropes to the floor, bumping over top rope clothes. He's probably taking more bumps in this match than he had in, in the first 10 months of 1998. And then, and then Nash just... Hit a big boot, and he hit a power bomb, and he pinned him. Well, here's what I'm going to say about this, okay? So, if they've made it up in their minds that Kevin Nash is going to end Goldberg's streak within one month's time or so, it's a little over a month, if they have made up their mind that that's going to happen, and actually, the, the original idea was that Nash was going to beat him at Starcade. So, knowing that, knowing that the guy is going to beat him and win the title in about a month's time, it is by far not the worst idea in the world to have him beat the undefeated Wrath before the match with Goldberg. That's actually good booking, okay? I don't even have a problem with that. The biggest issue is, like, it should have been something. This should have been Nash's final match before the big match with Goldberg. Like the go-home show for Starcade. It's going to be Kevin Nash versus Wrath. Wrath has run roughshod through everybody in the company. He's also got an undefeated streak. Can Nash beat this streak? What's going to happen when he gets in there with this guy? Build it up for like three weeks and make a big deal out of it. Instead, Nash wins the World War III Battle Royal... In a completely unadvertised match the next day, he just walks in there and beats Wrath. I mean, come on. Like, do something with the guy. You spent so much time building him up, and this is what you did. That's my biggest problem with it. Yeah. The match was much better than I was expecting, but still kind of depressing. It's also funny. They had two weird things. Like, first off, Mike Tanay rarely makes mistakes, but... And I listened to this twice to make sure that he said it. He goes, Nash needs to avoid looking past Wrath towards his world title match with Sting at Starcade. I was like, Oops. Sting? Who? And then Shivani made the comment that, you know, Nash is maybe 6'11", but you can call him 7 feet. I was like, okay. It's wrestling. <laughs> I guess so. Chris Jericho came out for a promo with hair that very well may have rivaled Enzo Amore's. <laughs> He's been 
for a few weeks here, he's been trying to be spectacular, but it, it doesn't hold up 20 years later. But this haircut, this was amazing. He said, Stu Hart had tried to make him a cowboy, and he hated cowboys ever since. And he was interrupted because Bobby Duncan Jr. came out with Ralphus, and he hogtied him and left him in the aisle. What in the hell was Jer- this? <laughs> That's what it is. It was so bad. Well, it was, but it led to something awesome. Because Jericho runs up to try to help Ralphus, and they go to the break. And they come back from the break. Jericho is still trying to help Ralphus. He can't untie this man, and the announcers are just crying with laughter. They can't contain their mirth. And then Scott Hall comes out, and Jericho runs away. So Scott Hall and Alex Wright all says this will be his last survey. He took credit for starting the NWO and it made it clear he's not affiliated with either faction. Then Wright cuts a promo saying the stupid people and Scott Hall both need to show him respect. So Hall's point was the NWO kicked him out last night. But to the best of his knowledge, he started the NWO and he started it all by himself. And so if he's alone again, that's fine with him. And he's plugging the thing with Nash. Basically what happened was Nash took over his booker. Nash, to his credit, realized nobody wants to see me and Hall fighting. And so he's putting them back together again. That's what's going on here. So they're doing this match, and they're actually making it very clear to you, the viewer at home, that Scott Hall has conquered alcoholism. He's over it. He's done now. They did a match, all over the edge, and the crowd liked him. Yep, total baby face. Yep. Had Bret Hart versus Dean Malenko. Went a long time. They did good wrestling. Nobody much cared. They were far more interested in whatever was going on in the crowd. Went on a while, and then... Uh, Dude, this went on like 15 minutes. And Bret's working over... Right, this match. Hey, Bret's working over his bad leg, and... It was a it was a fairly solid match, but Malenko would make these comebacks and barely sell his leg to the point that the announcers actually had to acknowledge it. And they're like, you know, maybe he's not hurt so bad after all. I thought, man, Dean Malenko of all people is like forgetting to sell his leg to the point where the announcers have to acknowledge it. Went too long for this crowd. It just went on and on and on. And then 14 minutes and 36 seconds. Yep. And then after the commercial break. After all that, so a chair ends up in the ring, okay? Just think about this. Chair ends up in the ring. The referee confiscates it. Brett ends up doing a high spot. Dean falls down, grabbing his leg in a leapfrog. Brett takes him outside. He does the figure four around the ring post. How long does this take? Like, what, 30 seconds? Sure. Okay. Brett then throws a guy back in the ring. The fucking referee has not removed the chair yet. Like, this referee needs to be fired. What was his chair doing in the ring for 30 seconds while the guys are outside the ring? Brett gives the guy a diamond cutter, because he's feuding with DDP. Gives him a diamond cutter on the chair. This is a DQ. The referee DQs Brett, even though it's his own fault that he didn't remove the chair. Not one single announcer even recognized the fucking diamond cutter here. It wasn't until DDP ran down to the ring that I think Tanay goes... You know what? I think he used the diamond cutter on that chair. And then Heenan's like, yeah. you know, you're right. And I thought, God damn, there's like one one point to this match, and none of you got it. So Paige runs down Brett the hit scum heart. And uh that's it. Called him a wuss. That's it. Yeah. Great. Goldberg versus Giant. Giant did not even get an entrance, and I don't know this, but I would, I, I would guess right here that this is his last WCW match. There are not too many laps, for sure. So, Giant was, in fact, a giant. Just completely dwarfed Goldberg. He had a choke slam 30 seconds in. The Goldberg kicked out. And then Goldberg no-sold some chops and hit a spear. All of Michigan exploded with glee. The Great Lakes may have been drained by the sound of the, the, the power of this reaction. And then Goldberg grabbed him 
this big, giant, fast giant, and he hits this jackhammer. And it's not like where he snapped him over and then fell down and landed on top of him. He held this big bastard up there. And he hits this jackhammer, and he pins him. The place goes completely insane. It was amazing to see. So in a minute and a half, in hindsight, just for that last finish, this may have been better than the Bret Hart promo. It may have been. But you know what? So... I, 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 this is, like, the reaction that Goldberg got was unlike anything else on this show. Like, they went from being just a stupid wrestling promotion, losing a war, to the hottest promotion in the whole world for that minute and a half. How any fucking idiot could watch this and determine that Goldberg should lose to Kevin Nash in a month is absolutely astounding to me. Like, it's astounding. It was crazy. And Goldberg wins. Bigelow hits the ring. Geeks break it up. Nash comes down. Nash and Goldberg have a pull apart. And I'm just watching it thinking, you know, I have no problem with a Goldberg versus Nash program because Nash was a big star. The fans were super into the feud when they were in there together. But the idea that Nash was going to beat the guy, especially after this match with the Giant and every single time Goldberg comes out there, like, how stupid, like, how stupid are you to have put that match together and gone through with it? It's it's mind-blowing. Well, they did. They did. So, as is tradition, I shall list the finishes on this show, but they are much, much, much better than we've seen from either show in recent weeks. We had a clean submission. We had another clean submission. We had two clean pins in a row. We had a match where there was distraction, but the guy who was distracted won clean anyway. That's one, two, three, four. That is five clean finishes in a row, which is unheard of in 1998. Then we had a DQ due to interference, another clean pin, and then finally a stupid DQ after a match that went forever, and then a clean pin in the main event. Hey, that's a great. I'll take that every time. You know what's amazing is, is like I talked about earlier, I mean, the show booked by Kevin Nash, like it was way better except for the stuff involving Kevin Nash. That's right, yes. It's almost like when you're the booker, you shouldn't be a talent. Well, I've heard that before. And Anyway. <laughs> Nitro number 168, November 30th, 1998. The NWO arrived in about seven limos. The announcer said Hulk Hogan had retired. Now these men have no leader. What are they going to do? So they went from the limos in the parking lot, through the parking lot, into the building, through the hallways of the building, <laughs> down the ramp, down to the ring to cut a promo. As someone who was running very late and needed to get caught up on time, thank you, NWO, for wasting six minutes before anyone actually did anything. You know that you can drive those cars right into the building. I love that they... I was certain they got lost at one point. <laughs> they showed Spinal up. Final tap. Yeah. And the answer said on the Tonight Show, this past Thursday night or whatever, Hulk Hogan announced that he is retired from wrestling because he's going to concentrate on running for the president of the United States. Because, they said, Hulk Hogan cannot run the NWO and the United States <laughs> at the same time. That's fair. That's what they fucking said. Yeah. I almost died. It's a good thing, too, because they actually showed clips, you know, in 98 of him on The Tonight Show, which saved us about 15 extra minutes on the show. So, with Hogan out of the picture, they announced Big Papa Pump as the new leader of the NWO. Because he's got muscles. He's got big arms. Yeah. Scott awesome. said Hulk Hogan invented having the largest arms in the world, mm -hmm. but now I have the largest arms in the world. So, of course, Because Hulk when Hulk retired... He no longer had the largest arms in the That's world. That's right. Apparently. This is all so stupid. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's noticed or not from the way we've described it, but we're not making any of this up. Yeah. It also looks like you can take a pin and pop Big Papa Pump. So to recap, Hulk Hogan retired because he can't run the NWO and the United States at the same time. Yeah. He invented having the largest muscles in the world, but then he retired. He no longer has the largest arms in the world. Now Scott Steiner does. Yes. They're gifted to him. They're handed down. So, 
Steiner is continuing the NWO feud with Scott Hall for walking away. Challenged Scott to find a partner to face himself and Horace tonight. Yes. Horace. Scott Steiner and Horace versus Scott Hall and a mystery partner in your main event. Actually, it was weird because... Not a mystery very, very long, but... Yeah, it was just weird. Like, I could have sworn... Maybe it was another segment, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Conan versus Chris Jericho. All right, here's the story. <laughs> because Conan beat Chris Jericho. This match went how long? Who has time? I You mocked me for so long, I didn't even bother Okay, anymore. this went 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just went on forever, way longer than it needed to, and I was I during the match I was getting so mad that it just kept going. Yeah, I'm like, why is this match so long? It does not need to be this long. Then they changed the title, and it was kind of like, well, the title change, fine. You wanted to put in some time for a title change. So as we talked about last week, Kevin Nash is the new Booker. Mm-hmm. Here, all of his buddies are getting belts. Now, granted, Jericho had not re-signed a new deal, and Eric Bischoff had given everybody the ultimatum. He said, if you do not sign a new deal, like, you're all being taken off TV till you re-sign. So Jericho hadn't re-signed, and so this was, this was getting rid of him. So you could say that Conan had to win the belt because Jericho hadn't re-signed, but they could have put this belt on anybody. But it was Nash's buddy. So that's why Conan became the television champion, which apparently on our board, nobody remembered. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> not that I have a great memory of the TV title or anything, but you know. far be it from me to critique anybody's cardiovascular. But uh, Conan, <laughs> not got, a good long match wrestler, got blowed up. Oh, he did, dude. He gets blowed up like every time he wrestles. He gets blown up. He does his catchphrases. He gets blown up in two minute matches. By the way, speaking of blowing up, I listened to Lance Storm's podcast today, Brian. I heard. And Vinny, do you know who Lance's guest was? Uh, was it one Timothy Flowers? It was. I, I, I knew he was going to be on the show. I had heard nothing about it. And they you know talked, what's so funny about this story? They talked No, about, hold on. Okay, Before you I'm tell sorry. what he said, I'm going to tell you the last time I talked to Tim. Okay. I Buddy's there. funeral. We were all there. Okay. At Buddy's funeral, he reminded me that we had once done an Iron Man match. Like I needed to be reminded mm-hmm. that I once wrestled for one hour with Tim Flowers. And he said, wasn't so hard, was it? It was easy. We mm-hmm. just paced the entire thing. Right. He goes, I wasn't even starting to get tired till the very end right there. Mm Mm-hmm. So what did he say on Lance's show? Well, he said that... Two months after this discussion we had. He said that, uh, number one, that you got blown up. Yeah. I don't remember this. Let me me fucking tell you a story, okay? (laughs) What have I done? I'm gonna make it quick. Uh Uh-huh. Do you know how hard I trained for this stupid fake match? Uh Uh-huh. I do actually remember this. I got on that goddamn Stairmaster at Gold's Gym right up there in Mill Creek. I climbed my ass up those stairs for 90 minutes every single day. I climbed. Then the next day I would get on the treadmill on the high incline and I would do intervals. Okay, let me tell you something, everybody. It's fake, okay? Like, you don't need to have cardio like this to do a 60-minute match. I could have... I should have just done, like, a five-round fight. I fucking trained so hard, and when that match was over, I was kicking myself for training that hard. Because it was a fucking waste of time. Anyway. Anyway, I got a good chuckle out of it because I knew that Tim was full of crap. Well, I mean, to be fair to Tim, he didn't get blown up either. Well, yeah. But let me tell you, you didn't get blown up in that match. Me. Right. Killing the town, everybody. Storm and Cyrus. It's a great show. So Conan won. He uh, Jericho tried to use the belt, but it backfired, and Conan hit the X-Factor onto the belt, and the ref said, well, screw this guy, and counted the pin. New TV champion. People, speaking of uh, athletic events, these people popped like it was an Olympic gold medal win here for Conan. This TV title, the tertiary belt, meant so much to these people. Well, you know, I was watching this show. It's a word. It's a word. Tertiary is, is correct. I'm write yeah. that down. So, it's after secondary. I see. Tertiary. Anyway. Before quadary. Hmm. You know what I noticed on this show is Kevin Nash is really over. Yeah. Now, granted, and it was it. really, really stupid for this guy to beat Goldberg, but I do have to say, he was really over. When he came out to celebrate with Conan, the place went nuts. They loved them some Wolfpack. 
So in celebration of Conan's title win, they replayed his rap video. I didn't watch it again. I didn't either. I won't lie. And I loved it. <laughs> Me? I got a finite amount of time. Which, thank God, because this Flair promo, I watched this <laughs> three straight times through and through. Well, you probably do a better recap than I can then. Flair comes out. This was like one of a thousand all-time great Ric Flair promos. Yes. Remember when Vince did that promo a few weeks ago and I just said he was the greatest character in wrestling history? It was not the greatest interview. Ric Flair is the greatest interview there's ever been in the history of this business. And there, I, I refuse to hear otherwise. First, he comes out here and he just cuts this great promo on Barry Windham because Barry jumped him last week. Then he cuts his promo on Eric. He says Eric abuses his power. He's an asshole. He says if Eric wants... exact words, by the way. Yep. Asshole. He says, go ahead and bleep, bleep me. You're an asshole. They didn't bleep him. No. He says if Eric wants to fire me, fine. But tomorrow, in your neighborhood, there's going to be a 12-year-old boy who's going to come up to you and say, Ric Flair called you out. And Ric Flair's an old man. This is the key to this whole thing here. Mm-hmm. Flair... You can't bury a guy too much. Jericho talks about it in his book. About Goldberg, actually. When he did one of his promos on... Or it wasn't Goldberg. It was somebody. But anyway. Can't bury a guy too much. Flair, in this promo, explained why. He said, tomorrow, everybody's going to come up to you and they're going to say, Eric, Flair's an old man. Can't you beat this old man? This Ric Flair. He's got diminished skills. He's an old man with diminished skills. Can't you beat this guy? He said he'd fight him tonight, tomorrow, anytime, anywhere. You're going to have it out once and for all. And he finished off with, come jump on this old man. This fucking promo. Okay? This was the difference between Ric Flair and The Miz. Okay? Miz... The? There's only one? Well, there's a few, but... (laughs) Miz is a great talker. Sure. But with the exception of the Daniel Bryan series that he had... Miz has never cut a promo that made me want to see him in a match. Never. Except Daniel Bryan. I did want to see Daniel Bryan just like beat his ass and show him how to do the kicks and everything else. That was the one exception. But Ric Flair, Ric Flair made me want to see a match between him and Eric Bischoff. That's a good point. Bischoff is fucking terrible. The one thing he's got is he knows karate and he can't even throw a believable kick. But when this was over, I was begging to see this match. That is a great promo. This was a masterpiece. In his continued uh, efforts to fit in here in the Attitude Era, he comes out in black jeans, a button-up shirt, and a black leather jacket. It was a big improvement over khakis and a polo. Scott Hall comes out for a promo. Outright says he doesn't have any friends anymore, but he will fight either Steiner or Horace one-on-one. Out comes Nash. Says they have not seen eye to eye lately. But if you need a partner, I'm your Huckleberry. Because Tombstone is awesome, and even Kevin Nash knows it. I just love that <laughs> it's just coming out to be Hall's partner. Yeah, it's all water under the bridge. Don't Hall be threw him through a fucking wall, well, if they, I recall they, they, correctly. They've, they've, I mean, it's been a gradual thing. He so, said that he... <sighs> they've been in a gray area. <laughs> the wall was three weeks ago, by the way. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> it's, been, it's fairly recent. <laughs> But he, he, he talked about how he, he would make, he would win when Hall was his friend again. He, he said he wanted Hall to be friends again. He has said this, and uh, this he wasn't a glutton. there yet. Maybe he's, maybe he's one step closer today. He's a glutton for punishment is what he is. And not one fan bought it when they came out together. Everybody thought one was going to turn on the other. Yeah. Raven and Canyon versus Scott and Steve Armstrong. Yes, this is a real team. Both of them, actually. And the... Another for the wacky coincidence file. Ravens out here in an Inhumans t-shirt when they're about to get their own show here in 2017. I totally forgot that uh, Steve was in the Young Pistols. I forgot which Armstrong that had been. He's out here in his Young Pistols gear. Can't do that gimmick today. Yeah, Couldn't not. do it then. He was no <laughs> Young Pistol. So Raven starts to cut a promo about not getting affection from his mom. And Kenny cuts him off and says, dude, we've been hearing the same shit for two years. And they start to wrestle... And Canyon cuts them off, both of them. Hits a bunch of finishers. Raven just leaves. Canyon hits a flatliner, has the match won. But he's distracted by his own partner walking out, and Scott pins him with a cradle. Big win for the Armstrongs. They threw the best celebration afterwards. 
Did they? They just went nuts. They're jumping up and down. They're high fiving. They're hugging. This was great. It was good to see the Armstrong brothers get a win. I love Canyon's gimmick where he's who better than Canyon, and the crowd screams, "Everybody!" And he does it week after week after week, and has the audacity to look surprised when the crowd turns on him week after week after week. Of course. You think he would get it. The simple stuff works best. I love Raven's gimmick where you get paid six figures and you don't do anything. Also true. You don't put your gear on. You guess he had boots on. Remember at the end when they cut the pyro out and he gets in the ring, looks straight at the camera, where's my pyro? Was that in Nitro or ECW? I'm totally on Nitro. Nitro. That was a dumb question. When did ECW have pyro? Yeah. Well, they had a couple of sparklers. Did they? they had some fire here and there. <laughs> they had fire. Not the same thing. Mostly on tables. <laughs> or people. Me and Gene brings Bret Hart out for a promo. One of my all-time <laughs> favorite promos. So the story is, in Bret's words, Dean Malenko had tried to fracture his groin. The people... We're not what in the hell's going on out there? Well, since you brought it up, there's shouting going on. Is it downstairs or Is outside? Is that outside? Brian's going to investigate the mystery noises. Are we recording? Yeah. Oh. There's a, some sort of incident outside. Now, he's he's peeking through the blinds, but he's not raising them so as not to be seen. Oh, he's, he's listening through the blinds. Oh, so thank you. He's listening through the blinds. Yeah. Well, I'll be very quiet so as not to disturb him. Like our, our mics are picking this up, right? I would imagine. It's awfully loud. There's definitely shouting going on. Okay, Brian's left the room. All right, Vinny, go to the end real quick. How long is this cord? Can I follow him? <laughs> Investigative journalism. I do. I feel like I feel like Gene. <laughs> Grab a camera. Let's go. It's TMZ. No, a good reporter. Oh, yeah, my bad. All right, Brian's back. I'm back. Yeah? Is everything okay? I don't know. <laughs> it's you not see, my house. All right, well, what's well, shouting's outside then? It's, it's definitely outside. Okay. I'll keep monitoring it. If I keep hearing it. Yeah. Craig, you're going to go out there and see what's is, going on. Is that right? You heard me. Okay. I'm too valuable here. I, that's true. I, so anyway, <laughs> let's talk about the beginning of this promo. Okay, go ahead. Bret Hart notes that Dean Malenko tried to rupture his groin. He had to have this planned. It's a heck of a grip. Because he didn't get a big reaction for the line, but he pretended he did. So they could turn to the fans and say... You fans don't understand, because none of you have groins. Died. <laughs> none of I you have groins. absolutely died. He meant it. Yeah. He straight-faced this. He meant it with everything in his being, that <laughs> it, these fans didn't have groins. Thousands of groinless fans. Hmm. He insisted his doctors would not let him fight with his groin injury. Do you know what's astonishing about this? I just want you all to think about this as we recap this show. He has an injured groin. Right. For real. Sure. Okay. Just keep that in mind as we get going here. So Paige comes through the crowd and starts to make fun of Brett. And Brett says, listen, doctors, educated people. Real people. <laughs> That's what he said. Real people. He said real people to educated people. They won't let me wrestle. So Paige called him a damn liar. He said, if it's true, then you have been excellently executed. And Brett got mad, and Paige kept trying to bait him into a fight. And Brett says, I can't fight. I didn't even bring my gear with me. And Gene says, it's easy to get your gear back here. No, he says, we can get you gear. <laughs> like, someone's got trunks. I, Somebody's got some knee pads. He, the way he said it was I'm just, sure we can find boots. We'll get a FedEx from Calgary in an hour, and it'll be here. So finally, Hart says, look, if you want to defend your title... Against a cripple in a no DQ match, and that's fine with me. And Paige agreed to those terms like a fool. Brett played him like a fiddle here. Oh man, did he, he ever, set a trap and did Paige he ever just died right onto that cheese? And you know what? Paige was he was a great promo here. He pushed all of Brett's buttons, which by the way, Brett wanted to be pushed. Brett was a great Brett was a damn liar. He was. Yeah. Eddie Guerrero. I love this. Eddie Guerrero, not, not Eddie. Brett is a treasure. Well, yeah. Everybody buries his WCW tenure. And I mean, he didn't do jack shit, but... <laughs> but what he did was great. He was awesome <laughs> doing nothing. He was awesome doing... Yes, that's it. He was yes. awesome doing nothing. Yes. Can you get paid for that? 
Hell yeah, he got paid a shit ton of money for this. Huh. I got to rethink my life choices. I think that all the time. <laughs> Eddie Guerrero versus Kidman. Long match. Went through a commercial. A lot of sub holds. So Kidman makes his comeback. They do near falls. Then the ref gets bumped. The LWO runs out. Kidman wipes out Hooventude. Ray wipes out Eddie. And I thought at first it was going to be one of those oops, I accidentally hit my boss kind of things. But no, it was clearly what he meant to do. He throws the ref in the ring. Kidman is the shooting star press. The ref counts two. The bell rings. The ref counts a third time. <laughs> Kidman and Ray flee. This was a fine match for a long time and then just completely fell off a cliff at the end. It had a bullshit finish. But my big takeaway for like the fifth week in a row now probably is when Kidman first won that belt, the place went absolutely crazy for the guy and it was like they created a new star or at least kind of a guy. One match when Scott Hall went out there and just squashed him like a geek, the guy has never, ever recovered. They have not been into him one single solitary time since he got killed by Scott Hall. It takes one match making a guy look like a geek to kill him. That's the lesson I took away here. For all of you who think wins and losses don't matter, they do matter. Bam Bam Bigelow was shown sitting in the crowd. Bischoff and Barry Winden came out for a promo. For some reason, Barry's standing there with his shirt unbuttoned. Thank you. And his guts hanging out. <laughs> it's not just that. Why? He had the denim vest yeah. and the leather jacket, but no shirt. Yeah. It wasn't even a vest. It was like a denim button-up shirt. No, it was a denim unbuttoned. vest. unbuttoned. It was a denim vest that he wears to the ring. His gut's hanging out. I understood. <laughs> his gut was hanging out. Right. And he's fat. Correct. What was he thinking? I was thinking, back in the 80s, this looked awesome. And he was just really hot in November. And he put a leather jacket on. <laughs> I like Fail, my, Vinny. Fail. I like my stomach cool, but my arms toasty. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> Regardless. <laughs> Regardless. Uh, Bishop gets a promo, says, the world needs a hero. Talks about all the dire things going on. Says... Come on out, Dean Malenko. Horsemen all appear. They are suspicious that he agreed to send Dean down to the ring alone. So Bischoff says, listen, Dean, I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to book you against Barry Windham. And if you win, then I will wrestle Ric Flair. And Dean says, in as wooden a manner as possible, <laughs> the horsemen never back down from a challenge. And tonight will be no different. We've been watching the horsemen from the 80s lately. <clears throat> These horsemen are not horsemen. Well, no. The they're just not. No. Well, yeah, the two, Flair and Mongo. And Arn's there. Yeah. Mongo, as a horseman, Mongo's a better horseman than Malenko and Benoit. That's fair. And he's, he's a pretty goddamn good promo. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. He I thought you have... just meant the drinking and the partying and the not showing up for That work. is also well, part of it. He's so, no Tully, though. No, he's not. Few people are. Again, that's fair. So, Malenko accepts the challenge. And Eric says, okay, oh, by the way, here is your special referee. It's Dusty Rhodes. So, Dusty comes out in his NWO shirt. Also in a leather jacket. He's got the... Uh, he's gigantic. He's, he is huge. He's got the, like... It's like the m and haircut, but in the, in the very back of the bottom, it's grown out, so it's a mullet. Yeah. That's a, not a good look. <laughs> it's Dusty. You've seen Dusty's looks? I'm thinking Craig should try it. Ooh. I'm thinking no. <laughs> Why not? I got good hair. I'm going to leave it that way. So Dusty cuts his promo. He's, he's being all over the top and cheesy. Justice will be swift. I'm going to call it right down the middle. No shenanigans. At the very end, he says, may the best. And then he stops and he shoots Barry the biggest, goofiest smile ever. And he says, man win. I thought Dusty was great here. He was a little too great. Kind of gave away the finish. Little little cartoony for you? Kind of could tell the future in that? Yeah, he... This was too much foreshadowing. I knew a swerve was coming. Well, Dusty's involved. Of course there is. Wrath versus Bobby Blaze. Hey, you remember what I said about Kidman? <laughs> this do. fucking guy comes out and no one gave a shit. 
They kind of cared about the meltdown, but boy, Wrath is dead. Because he went out there and got beaten by Kevin Nash. Some clever fan created a sign that said, You will feel Wrath's wrath. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So yeah, Wrath won. I have... Terrence What's going on over there? there? How'd you lose your spot? I realize I miscounted the number of pit clean pins in the show. There's two. We'll get to that later. They were in Tennessee. That's why it was so clever. Cat and Sonny Ono came out for a promo. Cat dares anyone in the batch to come out and fight him, and out comes Saturn. Cat says, you are weak. Sonny Ono beat you. I'm going to leave the ring and not tear you apart. No, I'm no, no. Says, I'm, as a young black belt, I was taught to protect the weak. Yes. It's you, Saturn. You got beaten by Sonny Ono, so you're weak. And as a good black belt, I'm going to leave. As a good black belt. Saturn says, you're scared. And so, two fucking segments after the Bischoff thing, yeah. they do the exact same angle again. Yes. Shad says, listen, if you can beat Sonny Ono, you can have a match with me. So Sonny's scared. Shad whispers something. Now Sonny's not scared. I can only imagine what he whispered. I've got a plan involving Glacier. I got you. <laughs> oh. I, I got you, homie. Sonny Ono versus Saturn. Saturn hit a Falcon Arrow immediately. Knocks Cat off the apron. Goes to make a cover, but Cat pulls the rep out of the ring. Glacier runs out, kicks Saturn, puts Sonny on top. How did Glacier know about this plan? It was all an elaborate plot. This is a very elaborate plot that began with Shat issuing an open challenge and knowing that Saturn would accept. Right. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Saturn kicks out of this anyway. Then Cat throws a chain to Sonny. But it doesn't matter. Saturn grabs him. It's a DVD for the win. But the referee finds the chain, assumes Saturn must have used this. because no other way he could have subdued Sonny Ono. Well, when he was in the DVD, Sonny tucked it into his trunks. I see. I see. So, the decision is switched. Saturn is DQ'd, so he gets no match with the Cat. You know, I gotta say, this probably would have been better than Saturn versus Ernest Miller. I, yeah, probably. And we're going to see it, so... I mean, we'll know one <laughs> we'll way or the other out. soon enough. Yeah, but we're also going to see Saturn versus Glacier. That's probably better than Saturn and Ernest Miller. I'm not sure, actually. Hmm. Goldberg arrived in a limo. Once again, somebody pulled him in a limousine and had to make the six-minute walk all the way through the building and down to the ringside. Or into the ring. Now, uh, Goldberg, out of his gear, looks weird. He's very big. You don't say. The Red Rooster's there to run the show. Nash came out, too. It's the contract signing. Bigelow is shouting, it should be my contract. So they get in the ring, and Goldberg's sitting there. And, of course, they're, they're not, like, on opposite sides of the table. The table's facing the hard cam, and they're sitting side by side. And Nash starts bugging out his eyes and making all these goofy little kid faces at Goldberg. Nash was such a D-bag in this, sec in this segment. He was so hateable. Oh, yeah. So, he signs. They had two contracts for some reason. Goldberg signs. Gene says, part of this contract is that Goldberg will not defend the title until Starcade to ensure that Goldberg and Nash fight for the, battle, uh, for the title there. Suddenly, Bigelow hits ringside. Security immediately swarms him. And then they gotta go the other way. They gotta drag him from the ring back to the outside. <laughs> There's so much camera time in this show just going from point A to point B. They take him outside, and they throw him up the stairs. He's in a, standing on the grass, shouting, and the fans are all shouting back at him. There were a lot of fans outside. Just you know, me for the middle of the show. I'm sure they clued some people in. I guess. This is so bizarre because Nash is a baby face. Goldberg is a baby face. And Nash is just being a complete asshole. Like, as a fan, you just want to see Goldberg... Absolutely destroy this guy. Absolutely. You would think. And it's not even like this led to Goldberg beating him in the match. He lost. <laughs> that really is the key. I mm -hmm. have no idea. We watched that Goldberg 24 or whatever, and he was a very, very angry man. He never had fun, he said. He never had fun until his final match in 2016. How the fuck did he not go over that table and beat the shit out of this guy? <laughs> How did he not just kick his ass? I don't know. Now, I think watching at the time, I don't think any of us for a second thought Goldberg was losing. So we probably didn't care about Nash being a dick because we figured he'd get his in the end. 
knowing how it all ends out, it's so much more aggravating now. Yeah. It's so irritating. Yeah, he booked himself into winning the title. And so he could act any way he wanted to. And his the way he decided to act was like a D-peg. Yes. I don't know. Booker T versus Mike Enos. God bless Mike Enos. Perfectly fine bottom of the card guy. People do not want to see Mike Enos beating up Booker T for this long. Total nothing match, Booker won. Anything else? I'm with a spine nope. buster. Hmm. For what I thought at the time was the first clean pin on the show, but I forgot about that Wrath match. So there's two clean pins on the show. I, I, of the night, I should say. Of the night? Including Raw. Oh, my God. Bigelow is outside inciting the crowd, demanding Goldberg come fight him. Lex Luger versus Brian Adams. Jesus Christ. This match. Of all the guys on the roster. Again, how many times have we... I feel like we've seen this a dozen times. Is it just two other shitty guys they keep putting together? No, I'm pretty sure it's Lex Luger and Crush here. Luger and Brian Adams again. Completely overbooked. It's horrible. Ref bump. Announcers are paying no attention. Heenan's busy talking about moving to Canada if Hogan becomes president. <laughs> Fucking Vincent has to interfere. Adams hits a chair shot. They do... Think about this. What is the worst move Brian Adams does? Pile driver. So, hey, let's do a stuffed shitty pile driver. On a chair. Hit Luger with it. He kicks out. Kinda. Finally runs Adams and Vincent together, racks him. Of course, the rack always gets a monster reaction. Mm -hmm. Place goes absolutely nuts. This went an hour longer than it needed to. It absolutely sucked. I was furious at this point. <laughs> it was not very good. They also mentioned that there was a Mark Curtis benefit show the night before. and That's right. They announced that Mark Curtis had cancer and very sad. They, they sent you back refing soon, which was extra sad. But yes, Lex was supposed to count out the spike pile driver. He could out a little late. The ref counted three anyway, and the match just kept on going. Which is always a bad thing, because it's Lex and Brian Adams. And yes, the torture rack cannot be screwed up. I can, but if you do it, if he does no, it... No, no. He got it on Brian Adams. Yeah. yeah. It can't be screwed up. <laughs> Point being, once it's done, it doesn't matter what is going to happen Who before that. Who was it that he had to try so many times? Roadblock. With? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said at the time, and I stand by this, it made it better. Can we just go back and watch 95 again? <laughs> I mean, not be a bad idea. So, the point is, when Lex gets the rack on, doesn't matter how long the match went or how shitty it was, everyone loves the torture rack. Mm-hmm. Barry Windham versus Dean Malenko with Dusty as special ref. Okay. A very tall man wrestling a very small man. That is true. They were they were not in the same weight class. No. Now, this whole thing was about Dusty and a special ref, and the special ref gimmick is always stupid. And this one was maybe even stupider than all the others by the time we get to. So, like, this wasn't a good match because it was just about the ref. The wrestling they were doing was so awesome. They worked so well together. When Dean went up top, and Barry... I assume, by the way, this is Barry's first match in, in who knows how many years that he, for this company. No, he was a new Blackjacks. Well, in this With, company. In this company, yeah. yeah. So maybe he felt he still had a, you know, he still had a, a paycheck. He had to earn his paycheck. He was working really hard. When Dean went up top, and it was just a simple chop the guy's legs off from under him, and he gets crossed on the, uh, on the turnbuckle. I've seen it done 200 times. He was so smooth, and his timing was so great on it. It ruled. Dusty and his, um, well, Dusty's a big man. Dusty's fat. Dusty would go down to count the pin, and he would take a knee. Yeah. And he would reach over and then barely hit the mat, because that would require effort. So it's Bronco Lubitsch. And then, yes. when he was getting back up, he actually pushed off of Barry to help him back up. Yeah. He was very heavy. He was... He was he was fat and he was old. Fat old guys don't move very well. Duly so noted. so they're doing this thing, and, uh, and 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 Dusty is being every shitty heel ref ever. He will count fast for the heel, but then stop counting when the babyface kicks out. All this stupid shit, and then Barry is beating up Dean in the corner, and Dusty counts five and he calls for the bell, and Barry is disqualified for kicking too much ass, but. Well, it was supposed to be like Dusty turning babyface. Yes. Maybe give him a five count that was fast in the corner or whatever. He yeah. was looking for an opportunity. Whole point is they did they did all of this heel ref stuff to make the swerve work. Mm -hmm. 
But fuck the swerve. It was so stupid. If Dusty is going to be on Malenko's side, why did he let his yes. friend take such a fucking will... beating before finally calling for the DQ? I'd kick his ass in the back. <laughs> I'd be so mad. Yes, D- Dean went through five minutes of torture to get his DQ in here. And then Dusty starts dancing and pulling on his dick. So at least we know he has a groin. I Dustin and Cody may have been proof of that. I, I must have not watched this that close. <laughs> Are you that. kidding me? No. He grabbed his wiener and just started dancing. I can always turn Vinny red. On <laughs> Here's every a funny show. word. He just grabs and he starts, you know. Uh-huh. As I'm doing right now. Oh, you're you're thrusting your hips. Yeah. I see. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> okay. <sighs> so. Keep your hands above the table, please. Dusty is right, or Brian's right about one thing. This whole thing was, in fact, about Dusty. It, it was. Well, that's nothing new. It was. It, to be honest, this was an act of self-pleasure. <laughs> Dusty got himself over to amuse himself. That's a fact. So, Dusty's leaving. Barry goes to attack him. The horsemen are there to beat him five on one. Then they go for Bischoff, but the B-teamers are there to scurry Bischoff to safety, and they go to commercial. Scott Steiner and Horace versus the Outsiders. I had forgotten this, but since no WCW refs will work with Scott, he has his own personal ref. Oh, my gosh. Which means we get the heel ref gimmick two matches in a row. Oh, yeah. Hey, let's talk about the best part of the show. So, Hall and Nash are going to team up for the first time in who knows how long. Mm -hmm. Hall is going to have a match. He wants a partner. Nash volunteered. He's going to be his huckleberry. So, Hall comes out first. They don't come out together. Right. right? Hall comes out first. No music. And so, he walks his way down the aisle. He gets halfway down, and he stops. And he starts shaking his hands, because he's going to do the double finger point to the back. And he's shaking his hands. (laughs) And he's shaking his hands. And he's shaking his hands. Somebody hit the music. And then he looks at the camera and he says, I dare you to play the music. I dare you. And then they hit the music. (laughs) And he does the point. (laughs) And then Nash comes out. And Nash looks at Hall. And Hall looks at Nash. Like, clearly they're pissed off about how stupid these idiots are for not being able to push the music button. But it worked because the announcers were talking about how they're skeptical of each other. And they got in the ring, did their match. Well, Hall did a match. Yes. Kevin Nash began the match in the apron, and he stayed there for probably 10 minutes. Just hanging out in the apron. Hall went the whole way. Don't want to get hurt before you break that streak. I guess not. It's every horrible heel ref match you ever saw. I have It's the same complaints I had last this time. This is the worst heel ref I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and that's saying a lot. So, eventually Nash tags in, and he just... First thing he does is just takes out the ref. Just throws him down. Bunch of stuff happens. Horace gets razor's edged. The ref is back. He still won't cat count. So Nash just picks him up and hits one of his best power bombs ever. <laughs> just playing with the guy. And then a real ref ran in. He counted three. This means, by the way, Horace was pinned by this razor's edge for more than a minute. <laughs> he, was, yeah. he may have broken his neck. And Nash walks out on his own. And uh, that's it. That's what happened. Cool. Goldberg. Stop me if you've heard this before. He's in the building, but we must follow him running out of the building. He goes charging out of the building. He goes up those stairs. He goes up the grassy knoll. They kept calling it grassy knoll. They weren't even in Dallas. They were in Tennessee. Right? Right. Yeah. So they have a brawl. It's funny. Goldberg, like security is following him, but then they get to the top of the stairs and they just stop. And a camera passes, like, through them to film the fight. So they fight in the grass for a minute or two, and they go fighting around some cars and trucks. And then all of a sudden, security says, oh, yeah, we are security. And they run out to break it up. That's that. And I got a few memories of this Bigelow return here, but I'm baffled that they're spending so much time building up Goldberg versus Bigelow. Mm -hmm. And the Starcade main event is Goldberg versus Nash. We already know they're not having a match before then. Because it's been made clear Goldberg is not defending his title until Starcade. Why are they spending so much time on this? This is the match I want to see Absolutely. as a fan, not Goldberg versus Nash. It's bizarre. And they had a hell of a fight outside. Mm-hmm. They're completely blown up within about 30 seconds because <laughs> one of them's fat and hasn't trained a lot, and one is doing two minute matches on every show. But 
Boy, did they they brawled. DDP versus Bret Hart. So very quickly, Giant runs out to interfere. It's no DQ. So they just do two on one for like five minutes. Giant hits a pair of just massive choke slams. And then Brett puts a he hits the second choke slam. And Brett goes over and just gives him the sweetest hug. Like when they chant too sweet at wrestling shows, this hug was in fact too sweet. Mm-hmm. And Brett puts him in the sharpshooter. The ref drops his arm th- arm three times. Brett wins. He's the new US champion. And they gave him time to celebrate like this was a WrestleMania main event. Like after Undertaker lost and Roman left and he had like 15 minutes to make his exit. That's how much time Brett had here just to be US champ with the Giant. Let's keep in mind, by the way, that Brett has an injured groin. Let's put the title on the guy who can barely move. Who can't wrestle. <laughs> what is going on? It's WCW. This show is so weird. <laughs> We're building up a match we're not going to give you. We're making you excited for a match that's not the Starcade main event. We're putting the title on Nash's friends, and we're putting the title on guys that can't move. I don't know what's happening. So the finish is on the show. Now, I missed that Wrath one, so I'll throw that in here somewhere. We have pinfall after a finish onto a belt. Pinfall after a guy was distracted by his own partner leaving. Guy got pinned on a two count after interference. A cheesy DQ... When the ref caught a guy with a chain he never used. A clean pin by Booker T. A submission after a three count that was encountered and also a bunch of chair spots. And then a DQ for kicking too much ass by a double crooked referee. Uh, I guess a clean pin or clean sub- a clean pin after 10 minutes of heel ref bullshit. And a submission after copious interference by a giant. Now let me be fair here. Kidman and Eddie Guerrero. I mean, that was a timekeeper's fault. He rang yeah. the bell on the two count. Absolutely. This was not something the wrestler screwed up. That's fair. Or the referee. That's they, fair. They, they all did everything exactly like they should have, and whoever was ringing the bell just got really excited. Yes. And rang the bell after a two. If you're the timekeeper, like, you're supposed to wait for the ref to signal to you, right? right? He's supposed to call for the bell. Yeah. What are you getting so excited for, buddy? Just relax. Mark. I mean, Christ, it was a bunch of bullshit at the finish. It wasn't that exciting. <laughs> Uh, Retro Raw 288, also November 30th, 1998. What you should have done is...